Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn and Dissident Dispatch. I'm your host, Deb Philman. And I am jumping right in today because I have the lovely Roxanne. Please say your last name for me because I'm going to Roxanne bond. Hogue rhymes with rogue. Okay. Yeah, Roxanne exactly. Hogue, who is the lovely and the talented uh, here with me to help talk about this topic, Black History Month. Um, before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, please like, share, and subscribe. If you are not already subscribed to the channel, you'll notice that the chat is open to subscribers only for the moment. I hope you'll understand, given the nature of this subject matter and its tendency to inflame the audience, we are going to we're going to give ourselves a little bit of a break. Uh, but please, if you do have questions, drop them in the chat, and we'll get to them sort of between little segments. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that for some reason, my earbud things are not working. So when I do play video, I will try to mute myself to cancel out any echo, but I hope it works all right. Please bear with us on that technical difficulty. So let's dive right in. Um, the reason I'm doing this show is that we are in Black History Month right now. We are five days in. And I've noticed as an educator some interesting trends going on with, um, the, well, we know that there there have been trends in the teaching of race and, and so forth with our kids. But in terms of how we present Black History Month, I've also noticed a change from when I was a kid, probably when you were a kid, that instead of focusing on history, we seem to be focusing on some other things, more identity-oriented things. So my question, as I said in the title, is are we celebrating or are we segregating at this point? And I've asked Roxanne to join me because um, you d presented a short piece for Prager U some time ago, and you talked about, you, it was titled, Woke Schools Are Damaging Our Children. and I think that you were sort of touching on some of these identity issues. Would you help us understand what you were talking about and tell us anything else about yourself in relation to this that you want to share? But that's sure. that was one of the reasons I was like, Roxanne has some thoughts. I want to hear them. <laughs> I have I have lots of thoughts. I will say there's one other technical issue going on, which is that I am incredibly nearsighted. And as I got old, I'm also farsighted. So okay. uh, if you play anything, I am completely blind to it. So. Okay. <laughs> Because I, I'll have no worries. I'll book. be doing all the reading and I'll just ask you to respond. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, so just a little bit of history so that it makes sense. I am actually was born a British subject. I was born in the island of Jamaica, um, of an English uh, mother and a Jamaican father, and uh, emigrated to America when we decided to dally with democratic socialism, which, hot tip to everybody who thinks it's really cool, it ends up with mobs <laughs> dragging people out of their cars and um, killing and robbing and raping people for their possessions. So in other words, it doesn't go that well. So we came to America very fortunately um, because I had an American stepfather. And going from not just citizen, you know, subject to citizen, but also from a country whose motto is out of many one people and where there's actually a lot of diversity, um, actual ethnic diversity of all kinds, uh, huge Chinese and Indian and English populations. There's even a place in Jamaica called Germantown where everyone uh, is incredibly fair-skinned and blue-eyed and them talk, I read a Jamaican, they call them country people, you see? So coming from that and a country where um, there were people in power that looked like everything to America, which is uh, at, at the time and has become again, very race obsessed in a way that excludes all the other ethnicities in the world, save for two, sometimes three or four. Um, another caveat I have to say is that there's one race, the human race, everyone can, um, intermarry with everybody else and have right. children. We're not like, you know, mules, like <laughs> like horses and donkeys. We are actually, we Why are all humans okay. with the same DNA. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, and so I came here and then um, emigrated to get, you know, moved to California. I'm an actress. And I did a Prager U Stories of Us. And one of the things we covered was my experience at the time, having had four children go through a private religious school, which was really important to my husband and I, because we're kind of where 
we're spiritual people and yet it's not very sort of, you know, organized or on top of things. And so private school was the way for us to go because they weren't going to get structure or a religious foundation at home. Right, right, right. And I discovered that our school was going in a very disturbing direction. It, instead of being a place that it had been when we went there and it was a K to 12 school, so I got to be there for over 21 years, instead of everyone being a panther or a, a, you know the, the crusaders or a Viking or whatever um, right. theme that you are, we were starting to officially segregate the school into affinity groups. It got even worse uh, after my kids left with elementary kids being asked to choose what affinity group they were part of. And this was based on skin color, but more pernicious than that, it's based on the skin color of your minority parent. In other words, it's 2021 at that point, 2020, 2020. America had moved on. Like it was United Colors of Benetton for real. Um, we had had Barack Obama, a mixed race president. Um, yeah. Nobody asked anymore, what are you? What's your ethnic? Yeah. You know, we had 23 and Me. Everybody could find out exactly what percentage of where they were from. Right. If you turn on HGTV or the Food Network, people are, you know, master chefing and house hunting in all sorts of combinations. Right. Nobody bats an eyelid, except when it came to this new George Floyd motivated obsession with the racial identity of your minority parent. So they set these up for kids and I went, well, that seems kind of wrong because you're having a kid reject their white parent. It's often the white parent, right? Um, the, forget the kids who are sort of black and Asian. What are they supposed to do? Do they go to both groups? It yeah. just thought it introduced something that was very confusing at a time that, you know, children go through stages. Um, I actually, my last kids are twins and they go through stages. And one of the stages, especially for twins is, you know, is individuation. But first you have to belong to the group. You belong to the family. You're attached. You're physically attached to your mother. Then you're attached on the outside. Then you're part of a family. Then you want to, you know, marry your mom and live with your dad, whatever it is. You go through Freud stages and then you become a person, a whole person. At no point did I learn getting my psychology degree that what you should really be attached to is the amount of melanin in your skin. Right. And so my school started doing this. And so in 2014, I actually wrote a really extensive memo to the administration about what we should do about diversity, because by then I had noticed that we were really lacking in our diversity talk on one thing, and that was viewpoint diversity. There wasn't any. And you would be excoriated and you know tossed out on your ear if it was became clear that you thought that maybe criminals should go to jail. You yeah, know. I know. It's a really <laughs> revolutionary concept, isn't it? That you break the law totally, and maybe something should happen. Yeah, you know? Totally okay. wacky. I know. So they used to have, they had a, a, a group that was for, you know, children of black families, but the school itself was, you know, the jocks, the basketball kids, the football kids, the dancers, the theater yep. kids. And yep. in my son's class, he was lucky enough that like the theater kids cheered on the jocks and the jocks went to the Nutcracker. Day. My son was in the Nutcracker, even though he was, a, you know, so everybody was together. And right. then they said, oh, this is really going great. Let's add more groups that separate us. So then there became an Asian families, then there became a parents and uh, you know and friends of lesbians and gays, and there became um, a uh, uh, the 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 Latin families, Latin X as the as as white right. women, women like to call them, right. um, and the, and and I was like, uh, if someone asks for a white family group, are you going to allow this? And if you aren't, then what are you doing? So I did a, this Prager interview. We, they excerpted this little thing where basically I said that I thought segregation was bad. Now, Deb, you would think this is, again, not something that anyone could be upset about. And the thing that was you, drilled into our heads growing up. Right, Segregation right. is bad. Segregation is bad, right? Yeah, and yeah. now it's kind of like, what? No, no. Some segregation is really good to the point that I um, got in trouble 
and went from being sort of the like, you know, um, de facto mayor of the school and volunteer person everywhere um, to uh, you're really problematic and you're um, appearing on this, um, what did they call it? Simplistic propaganda website. And people are, I'm getting questions about what you're saying. Um, from people. And that was very uncomfortable because at the same time, and again, remember, think back to the summer of 2020. I have the fires to remind you um, that what was going on was everybody was, you know, St. George Floyd, peace be upon him. We have to do something about this and we have to do it in our nation's best schools, our most prestigious private institutions. And one would think that people would say, Wow, that's crazy. Where did that come from that all these places that produce the kids that are taught critical thinking and and have exposure to the most amazing resources that then go on to our nation's best institutions of higher learning and populate, you know, the tops of media and government and education and tech and like why are they all capitulating? Well, simultaneously that summer about 40 accounts appeared out of nowhere on Instagram. They were all with the same nomenclature, black at, and then XYZ school. The Dalton school, Head Royce, um, uh, Spence. I mean, really prestigious schools, including right. my kid's school. And that they were all anonymous. They all purported to be from alumni saying, I was treated so badly. This school's really racist. Oh my God, this teacher's really racist, making accusations, naming teachers who some of whom were removed from those schools and who I imagine have amazing cases to litigate. And I hope they are. Um, so it wasn't organic. It didn't no. happen. Really. And I, I realized that that was coming from somewhere and it's from a bad place. And because my school is a religious school, what I had written to them in 2014 was, do you, again, I'm not a biblical scholar, but I do remember from my children's Bible, the story of the Tower of Babel. And I was like, call me crazy, but I feel like the lesson from that one was by segregating into all these silos, we end up with chaos and a right. lack of connection. Right. Well, there's also in from the Old Testament, Lashon Hara, which is, you know, don't speak about other people and, you know, especially if it's going to do them harm, but don't do it in general. And what I noticed from your story is they came to you and said, I'm getting questions and I don't know what to say. A total lack of moral courage and leadership on the part yeah. of administrators. So parent A comes to the administrator and says, you know that Roxanne, she was in PragerU video. And the appropriate leader would say, and your point is what? I have to explain the source of the noise. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I have yes, five and, of them. And, and, and you know, isn't that their job is to say, this is, this? yes, Roxanne has a cat. Um, this is an institution of learning. It is a liberal institute, you know, a liberal of the old, you know, classical variety. And therefore, not only is Roxanne entitled to her point of view, so are her children. And so is everyone on this campus. And, you know, thank you for your interest and your feedback. But I would direct you to Roxanne to ask Roxanne what Roxanne is talking about. And then Roxanne can answer you. But I am the principal of the head of this school. And it is not for me to speak for her, nor is it for me to intercede on behalf of your feelings or your comfort to go back to imagine reverse exactly. white parent. What, you know, sees black parents speaking on behalf of something, something, you know, that would make them uncomfortable, maybe, who's, who knows, and goes to the head of school. I don't know, but this person was speaking up on behalf of something, whatever, black, and I'm just very uncomfortable with it. Do you think it would take the, the head of the school five seconds to say, tough noogies, like, not my yeah. problem? Okay, so this is, this is another thing that I've seen is the complete breakdown in leadership and moral courage to stand up for the values of the schools or of any institution for that matter that purports to be equal opportunity, liberal, et cetera, and so forth. Well, the, the fascinating thing about that is twofold. One is, I think some of the questions were from people who were, because uh, I say in my speech, be a little brave. And so they were questioning the school, like, why are you doing this? And so instead of the school backing up their bad decisions, they right. said, well, Roxanne's a problem. Um, 
the other thing is, um, I don't know if you know Pete Peterson from say this five times fast. Pete Peterson of the Pepperdine School of Public Policy. That's hilarious. <laughs> he, Poor guy. Oh my god. He's, he's amazing. He's amazing. Uh, he wears his name well um, That's awesome. and his job. He um was one of the first people to introduce in Southern California the the authors of the Heterodox Academy and to talk about Jonathan Chait's work and you know the whole um, um, breakdown of oh my God it's just uh, that great article from hate um, coddling of the American mind yeah or they wrote the book yeah and then right. yeah mm -hmm. so he said something fascinating to a friend of mine the other day do you know which um, which major is even more left then I said, oh, well, you know, education. No, even more left than education, where they started, which was brilliant, divinity. Schools of divinity got taken over first because that when this sense. stuff started happening in my school, which was a religious school, I went, aha, I know what I'll do. I'll go to the church the national and say like guys you know so i can say to the school you're yeah. you're you're working against you know what we all believed which was you know the golden rule treat others as you'd like to be treated i kind of sure. thought that should be it right when i went to the website for this nationwide uh very mainline religion it was all about restorative justice and george mm -hmm. floyd and you know deb any modifier in front of justice makes it less justice like justice of is course life. kind of like putting modifiers in front of emotions <laughs> like yeah. joy <laughs> yeah 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 so yeah. that was my um very rude awakening to the fact that um and and i and i feel for people when they say oh my gosh well we've got to do school choice and we've got to get this out of government schools and i'm like you guys are i'm glad you're at the party it's a little late. We still have chips and, and, and drinks, but the, the, it started a long time ago and it yep. started with mostly NAIS, the National Association of Independent Schools, um, right. with those schools. And so that is corrupted. Divinity is corrupted. Um, but the yep. only way to push back is the one thing that actually proves that America is not a racist country. People have capitulated in all these insane demands. By the way, you can't talk to a headmaster of a school anymore, of a private school. You know why? They're no longer a headmaster. They're a head. Because hearing right. the word master, apparently, just yes. like finding out about a master bedroom or, uh, or or becoming a freshman in college, all these things are triggering, triggering and horrible and it can't happen. So right. because those people are so well-meaning and they're such good people, right? They've devoted their lives to trying to, to help our young to sort of develop and become individual, authentic people. The thought that they might be called racist was enough to get them to sacrifice their integrity and in many cases, their own children. Because what has happened is people went, oh yeah, that's, oh yeah, it's another black children. By the way, if you believe in white supremacy as a motivator for why we have to have all these affinity groups, you believe in black inferiority. Because what you're saying is, oh, for Lord's sake, yes, a black child couldn't possibly figure out how to make friends on their own. We need to have this separate entity so that they can find yep. each other. Again, as I said, <laughs> I yep. Fox News one day, like black people can find each other. I have a I have a tweet to show later about. In fact, you know, why don't I just show it now? Because it's actually more relevant now that it's coming up in the conversation. But I just happened to have found this um, today, and it it blew me away. I was like, how how are people this dense to not realize what they're saying? But this came from this lady, black conservative educator, independent thinker. She says, so an ally discovered I am the sponsor for the Black Student Union at my school. Without hesitating, she invited my students to attend her motivating program for at-risk students. When I told her that the program would not apply to my students because their GPAs are 3.0 plus, she just stared at me with a blank look on her face as if all Black students were supposed to be at risk. You can keep your allies. Yep. That, there you yep. go. That's exactly what you're talking about. I was like, I saw that just today and I thought to myself, do these people not hear themselves? Yeah. Well, no, they no, do no. this stuff. It's like, you are literally racist. 
the most racist things I've had said to me in the past 10 years were from progressives. Like, oh, your kid got into XYZ school because they get to check black on the application. Oh, my God. Uh, do you know the kid? Like, first of all, have very smart kids. Second of all, what? You are sick. I'm the one who says I'm against affirmative action for this very reason. In addition right. to the fact that if you if you go to the wrong school with the wrong cohort, and that's why standardized testing was good, because you end up with your your similarly um, attuned cohorts, and so that you all run, like you'll do better if you are a C student at a, a student at a school that has lots of C students. You right. all thrive in a much better way than if you go somewhere you don't belong and you'll drown. Yeah. Or you'll, you know, learn from your president of your school to plagiarize Claudine Gay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and others. <laughs> yeah. And others. But it's, so it's insane. The, you know, the number of things, well, black people can't get IDs and that's why we can't have voter ID. Black people, yeah, do, oh, here's crazy. my favorite from Joe Biden, you know, black, black people don't um, have access to computers. <laughs> right. And so, the, you know, with, with this mindset, you know, attitude, whatever you want to call it in mind, you know, part of why I said, you know, I, I wanted to talk about this year's Black History Month was that I feel like this has all been building. You've been obviously on top of it. You've been speaking out about it. You've been saying, hey, you know, what about? And here we go into this year. And you saw what happened to me last weekend where I, I took issue and I'm not going to sit here and say I couldn't have written it better. I'm not going to tell you that I, you know, that it was the most perfectly written post that I've ever done. And it wasn't, you know, vague or whatever it was. But I did go in and I explained afterwards, but nobody cared. Nobody cared. Because really what, what it was, was even if I had explained it, because I did, people didn't want my explanation because they liked what it stood for, that, you know, Black joy is revolutionary. And my issue with Target was that I felt like they were, actually feeding into this segregation thing that you're talking about rather than using the opportunity of Black History Month to do what Black History Month was supposed to do, which I don't even think most people who are screaming at me know about. That's the thing that kills me is like, how many people do you think know the history of Black History Month and what it's supposed to be? Probably we, be included. I, I'm like, well, no, because but, again, I'm a naturalized American. Right, you're, so I you, like, have, you have a little bit more of a reason, right? But remember, <laughs> at least people went through American schools. And, you know, it's supposed to be an annual. African-American uh, history. Mute that. Back. Okay, sorry. Oh, they okay. started automatically. It's cool music. But um, is an annual celebration of achievements by African-Americans and a time for recognizing their central role in U.S history. Also known as African American History Month, the event grew out of Negro History Week, the branch held of noted historian Carter G. Woodson, and other prominent African Americans. Since 1976, every U.S. president has officially designated the month of February as Black History Month. Other countries around the world, including Canada and the United Kingdom, also devote a month celebrating Black history. Not Black identity, not Black uh, you know, not, not blacks against whites, not black BLM, nothing, just black history and the figures from it. So then I, you know, I, I know this and I actually have a lot of, I love history. It's my favorite subject. So I know a lot about the central figures and, you know, the most popular Cause, cause you're a big nerd. Yes. I'm a huge yeah. nerd. Like yeah. Frederick Douglass is a massive hero of mine, but you know, the, in a, in, it started to really irk me because I want children, all children, all children, okay, not just black children, like children, period, in America, to know our history, American history. Black history is American history. Black history is my history. I live in America. This country was built by all of us, black people included. So it is also the history of the country in which I live. So I want my children, everybody's children, to know about these amazing accomplishments and because everyone should know about them, period. I don't care what race you are. And so seeing them focus so much on the like, Black, as if Black History Month, first of all, is only for Black people to sort of celebrate and appreciate. And there's not really a role or like a like an, a, 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 a space for, for white children, Asian children, Hispanic children, forget it, all American children who don't self-identify as Black to 
celebrate this month and say, hey, there were these amazing people and we don't talk about them enough the rest of the year. So we're going to sequester a month to spend extra time talking about them. Fine. Um, other people say it should be all year. I tend to agree, but here we are. But I didn't see any history. I saw identity. And so then I went and I thought to myself, all right, let me go see what was this year's theme supposed to be? Well, this year's theme was African-Americans in the arts. And you're a person, you're in the arts. <laughs> you know, they, This is something that people like you have created and you know, all kinds of art are who we're supposed to be celebrating. Didn't really see much of that going on. There's plenty of information that could be used to teach children or adults the origins of Black History Month. It's all in there. Videos, all kinds of things people can download, so much stuff. And including like our own government. Here we have blackhistorymonth.gov has a whole site. What are they featuring? Art. 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 <laughs> this is what it I, I was expecting. This is what I would like. Yes. Thank you. Look at what we have here. All of the different things. This is recognized as it should be. And there's so much information that can be taught to the children. But instead, I was seeing, you know, other things. And then well, I think what you're what you're seeing is, you know, the crony capitalism. It's sort of it's it becomes pandering. And when yeah. you make a month for black history, which ghettoizes it and you're right, um, then other people are going to be like, where's my Asian history? Well, where's my Spanish history? Right. So then you, you you're going to balkanize again. But Agreed. not only that, Target and other retailers have decided that they are going to they're in Dan and Geld, right? They're they don't want they want to to not have to replace their windows in in the next George Floyd riot. Let's just say it quite plainly. They right. are going to make payoffs just like book. I don't know if you saw Christine Blasey Ford's book came out this week, and it's like it's it's a it's a money laundering operation, right? Thank you for your service, Christine. Trying to stop <laughs> um, Kavanaugh. It's not nobody's going to read the book. She didn't write the book. The book, you know, is going to they're going to publish ten copies, but she got an advance, and so that donors can get money into the publishing houses to get it to her. Sure, of Same course. Thing. And by the way, Target does this with Pride Month, which actually they're trying to make two Pride Months now. It's yeah. not anti-gay to notice that plastering a you know, shirts that say I'm here, I'm queer or whatever it is on, you know, on baby uh, onesies. Um, exactly. Not, it's not a great marketing tool. And you know that because I'm a huge remainder bin shopper right. and I always find those things in the remainder bin. Well, we and then here going to the remainder bin. And, and, and people, you know, so I see displays like this at a store like Target. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a store that's ostensibly for like all, you know, I mean, anyone can shop there, right? And the other, the, the other merchandise is not white merchandise. It's not Asian merchandise. It's just merchandise, clothing, et cetera. Um, and this also isn't about models wearing clothes. This isn't about featuring black faces. There's nothing to do with that. That's just a uh, that's just showing humans that wear clothes. When you have lines like this, where you're first of all specifically saying we're going to single out black business owners and we're going to specifically feature them and make sure that they get featured on our shelves. We're going to single out HBCU design challenge winners. We're going to put merchandise that really only black customers are going to buy because if I were to buy it, it would be bizarre. Like why, why, why would well, I? Well, it would also be cultural appropriation and you're not supposed to. <laughs> Duh. But then, you know, when I, when I mentioned these things and the, the, uh, the feedback was, you know, you just don't want to be excluded. And what I'm trying to get across, and please correct me if I, you think I'm insane, and I'll, I'll take it, um, is it's not about being excluded. I can't, I'm not included in the men's department. I'm not included in the big and, and large sizes. I can't wear the kids' clothes. Uh, you know, there's a whole range of things. They do have black hair care, which obviously I don't need. And they have, you know, makeup for skin kit tones I don't have. Okay, I don't feel excluded. This goes, it, there's a difference between including things that are very specific to people who need them and explicitly excluding everybody from a type of merchandise on purpose and then calling it Black History Month. That's not Black History Month. That's like Black Identity Month. That's Black Struggle Month. That's Black, you know, we're here and get out of our stuff month. Yeah. And that's I'll, you know what? I'll make two points. 
one about the hair products. And Inter interestingly enough, in the night, yeah, maybe the eighties, um, my roommate and I, um, both have naturally curly hair. She's Jewish and white and I'm obviously not. And we went to a talk. Someone had written a thing on good hair before Chris Rock took it. And she was so excited, she asked a question about something because we have the same texture hair. And the black woman who had written the book and did the book reading looked at her and said, this isn't for you. Which is the most horrifyingly racist and exclusionary thing right? that I've seen in a long, long time, right? right. So th that's that's crazy. The other thing, the what, because I did see that entire Twitter firestorm because I was like, what? yeah, I, I, get, I agree with Deb. What's going on? Um, somebody, I, I really didn't think it was that huge a deal, honestly. One, <laughs> was like, I, well, and now you realize why principals capitulate, while school boards, while priests, yeah. because no one wants to be dragged by that. And by the way, I but when you realize that I'm part of the dragging, I'm being called racist and I'm being shouted down because I'm not hashtag ADOS, which means an American descendant of slavery, as if my slavery was super easy and cool in Jamaica, but really different than in, in America, which I digress. Someone did have a person had a really good point. What about um, St. Patrick's Day? Kiss me on Irish shirts. Right. So I thought about that. And it's true. There are. There's a way to celebrate cultures. And, 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 and again, this goes back to my original 2014 memo to the school. When you make something about just identity. Yes. And it's about, oh, your membership. Like where my husband is white. Is he not allowed to come to the black families meeting? Like, does he get a special pass? Like you used to get in South Africa, you would get honorary white stamped in your passport if you were visiting so that you could go to certain places during the days of apartheid like why are we going backwards to that um if yep. instead you say well we're not and and what schools have done and what target is doing is they have given these identity groups and these identity celebrations the imprimatur they're under the aegis of the corporate head the all-knowing right so every pta group Right. It's part of the PTA. Uh, you're doing the ball. You're doing the your um, athletic boosters. You're the dance moms. Whatever it is, they're all yeah. part of PTA. Right. But the racial groups report directly to the head master, <laughs> to the to the head of school, right. and it's a, and they get a budget from the school, not from the parent. So you've already segregated on that basis. Right. They get their own graduation goodbyes, not a graduation party, but a graduation goodbye, which is also funded. Um, but by doing that, instead of saying, hey, we have a group in the PTA for people who love Latin culture. It's called La Salsa, whatever. Right. And that's so, sharing. And, that's right? cultural. That's like that's cultural awareness that's making people culturally sensitive it's saying you know come learn about our culture and or i really you just feel it like here's the amazing thing about america and about the west but particularly about america is that we and i said it's in the in in my prager you piece you're not relegated to your parents station or their ethnicity or their interest right. like in america a friend of mine just came back from basically like burning man for cars in, in the in the desert of California. People who soup up um ATVs and things and they race and they spend like a hundred thousand dollars on their car, whatever, and they and they race around the desert for two weeks. They get to do that. And that doesn't require you to be a particularly ethnicity to be a member. Um right. if you're into horses, there were black cowboys, there are Chicano cowboys, there's I mean there's that's some of the finest interest. cowboys ever in history were black cowboys. I mean, yeah, but there that's an interest. My my own brother, who's actually Italian Hungarian, like was a rocket scientist and then fell in love with yoga and the East and lived in India for 10 years. He gets to do that without having a drop of Indian blood because we're the West and we allow people to yeah. have agency and a bit of self-determination. And then the other point I, I can't forget that was in the mob that was ginned up is someone said, well, we have to have um, the black joy. You don't get it because we don't get to be loud. We don't get to. And I was like, well, first of all, 
black people come from all over and there are some African countries where the people are very, very quiet. Like that's their thing. Yeah. Right. Um, and have you not heard of Italians or Jews or New Yorkers or Puerto Ricans or like in other words, there are plenty of cultural groups where the norm is to be loud. That's right. And there are some places you go in the world where they don't applaud. I mean, so it, it, it is incredibly destructive and limiting that a ridiculous percentage of American high school graduates think slavery originated in America. I know they, they do. Slavery was only ever of black people. And they have no idea that That's it was right. black people that sold slaves to, to the ships That's coming right. across the, the Middle right. Passage. So and now they're and now they're aligning like in the, I'll show you the Black Lives Matter stuff for this week. They are aligning with the Palestinians in the, the war and everything going on. And it's like, do y'all understand that Arabs not only sold black Africans back in the day? OK, just, you know, but they're doing it right now. <laughs> they're doing it today, right now. As we speak, they are taking black African slaves and selling them to all over the place, not to mention making them work for them as slaves as it is. And they're incredibly racist. They're racist in China that treat black people terribly. Like it, this notion that it is this uniquely American thing. And then we also know that the slave trade was much more active in South America and the Caribbean than it was even in the United States. Yep. Under the United States got like slaves came to America, double that went to Jamaica, 30% went to Brazil. That's but, right. So that ignorance, I think it's all, everything you're saying, it's all embodied in one place. We can all, it's it's the textbook example, Mark Cuban. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, he's he helping talks, Roxanne. He's helping. He, he talks DEIJ like nobody's business, but I don't see any short white women running point guard for him on the no. Maverick. And no. I feel really left out. Yeah. Uh, he could even take me. Like, I could be ethnically, you know, a basketball player. I have yeah. no ball handling skills, but that would be very diverse. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and Unbelievable. He, he also, the other thing he did, which brings up what Target does and what other these businesses do, it is unfair to give contracts to people based on their race. Right. Like they didn't, they looked for. I think it's unconstitutional. I mean, like, I don't care about fairness. Like the concept of fairness is so like wishy-washy to me. I'm not really interested in fair. Our government is not, is not meant to be fair. It's meant to be legal. Okay. Yeah. And so like, according to the constitution, doing that sort of thing is discrimination, which is a violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which by the way, applies to everyone. It yeah. applies to all people. You don't even need to be a citizen. All people in the United States of America are covered by the Civil Rights Act. So it's not like only black people. Yeah, only, no, it's anybody. You can't turn around and say, we're not gonna hire you because you're white or we're not gonna give you business because we're not gonna, that is discrimination. And I don't understand it. How you know, Mark Cuban's sitting there, like in full view of anyone could go tag the EEOC. Yes. You know, like, hey, <laughs> this dude's like admitting that he's race, he's race based yes. hiring, and they get away with it. They're so James Lindsay pointed out today. They're so entrenched. They're so confident in their you know takeover of everything that they just flout the law. Yeah. Left, right, and center, and most because people... they're flouting it for the right reasons. They're oh, good people. Right. They're good people, and it's just you know the saddest part of this to me is that African Americans, ADOS people who grew up, you know, descended from American um, black people, right, have been given crumbs. They got the shortest month of the year. <laughs> they got this stupid ass movement, which sounds good, BLM, which really existed just so Patricia Colliers could amass millions of dollars and buy a lot of real estate and didn't help anyone. Um, they painted a bunch of crosswalks in honor of a thug. A thug. That's right. Their families have been destroyed. Destroyed by mostly the Democrat Party. <laughs> um, just the Democrat Party, actually. Not only that. <laughs> 
a racist within the Democrat Party known as Lyndon Johnson, who's yes, like valorizing yes. some great guy. And like, you do know he used the N word, like you use, you know, con- like, yeah, the article, like an article. The, an A. Yeah. <laughs> and and they, they accept the pittances of, uh, well, here, we're going to give you a really crappy public education education used loosely in a failing school so that you're going to graduate functionally illiterate, right? Right. Inner city schools are, and by the way, almost all schools in California, inner city or not, are graduating people who are functionally illiterate. That's the whole country. North Carolina, 66% of the black students in North Carolina are illiterate. And guess what they get as a prize? Government jobs. They get government jobs where they can never be fired from, right? So then they, that's, that's why your DMV customer service employee is so damn friendly. She'll never be fired. She doesn't even know how to write anything. I mean, obviously there are fabulous government employees, but that's what the exchange was. And they deserve better. God damn it. And actually Jesse Jackson had it right when he said, I am somebody. If you are a hashtag ADOS, an American descendant of slavery, you are freaking powerful beyond measure. You come from stock that lived through the most devastating transfer of people across Across the the Atlantic that the world has ever seen, and you lived through being treated like property and an absolute crap. So in your genes are amazing, amazing DNA of survivors. That's right. And yet you I choose mean, to have babies with men who care not a whit about you, who are taught to resist police, so they'll even more likely end up in jail. And you regard education as as nothing when it's your birthright. That is sad to me. And, you know, this, it is only a month, as you point out, it's woefully insufficient. Um, But there are people they're never going to learn about that would, in my personal view, would uplift or help uplift so many people but especially if you're wanting to see yourself in the person, not that I do. I mean, like I look at Frederick Douglass or I look at MLK or I look at Zora Neale Hurston or I look at some of these people and I read their words and I even Carol Swain. And I just think that's a person who makes me want to be a better person. And isn't that the point that we learn about these people's lives and in particular people who have overcome are some of the most interesting people and they have the most to teach us. If we're going to get all bogged down in our, I'm having a bad day and and blah, 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 blah. Harriet Tubman or so. Thank you. Like unbelievable. Unbelievable. Aren't those the people that we want everyone, all of our children, all of our children to learn about because then they will, when faced with some kind of hardship or whatever, maybe they'll have that story in their mind. And it's, and like I said, it's not about because, you know, the black students learn about black people. So they see themselves. I don't buy that. I don't buy that at all. I'm just saying that the thing that is special about having overcome, as you point out, is that that does kind of hone your character. And that does give us in subsequent generations uh, you know, a, a subset of people we know who to look at when we want to look at what are the traits, what are the kinds of people with moral courage and and the kind of uh, stamina, intellectual and emotional stamina that it takes to weather storms. Well, there they are. So it does make it a little easier to to find them, but that's it. It's not anything to do with how much melanin is in your skin. And so I feel like it does two things. It signals to children who are not black, oh, that's nobody I really need to like be paying much attention to. It's not my month, which is exactly the opposite of what it was designed to do. Right. And the rest of the months, and we know they're doing this explicitly, if they're talking to people who are not black, because the majority population in the United States for such a long time was white, that's just numbers. So a lot of the history of America is going to be, you know, looking a little paler. They think, I don't have to pay attention to that. That's not my history. That's nothing to do with me. So I just think overall it's negative in terms of how our children and how we as the evolving culture from the the children are seeing ourselves as people and deciding what kind of people we want to be. It's all about, I want to be this kind of black person or I want to be the, as opposed to, I want to be this kind of person. Yes. 
And I think you're really hitting the nail on the head there because so much of what's gone on, especially in the last few years when we were online and we could see what was happening in our kids' schools, yeah. has a, has been about removing our humanity from us overall. In other words, and this goes for all kids, you are your um, your anxiety diagnosis. You are your sexuality. You are your, instead of saying, oh, you're going through puberty and you feel awkward, Welcome to humanity. Oh, right. <laughs> you feel alone and invisible and unheard? Yep, that's life. Oh, that's right. you feel like people look at you funny? I mean, I tell my kids all the time, if someone looks at you funny, assume that they're constipated. Like, if other people are not thinking about you 24-7. And it is a real disservice, especially to Black kids, but to all kids, to right. say that anything bad that's happening to you is external. Because that's then right. you'll never have the impetus to fix it because exactly. you'll be like, yep. I mean, Larry Elder says it best. He goes, what white person is stopping you from cracking open a book and finishing your homework? That's it. I mean, really in a nutshell, that's it. And when I saw that, that sweatshirt on this beautiful little girl and, and, and you know, look, I'm happy. She's smiling. She's also been told to smile because she's been having her picture taken. But this idea that it might be taught to her that her joy can only exist in a space free of white people where, or that her joy exists in spite of white people, in spite of and, white people. And supremacy. the truth is to be joyous in life is an accomplishment. Like Dennis Prager said, you know, like happiness is a serious problem. Like, especially yeah. now when people are taught, oh, are you depressed? Oh, let me give you a pill for this and a pill for that. Right. So all joy is revolutionary. Right. Like every joke is a it tiny can change your life. It certainly can. But it's like this idea that it is a separate, you know, joy is joy. Like you, yeah. you and, you know, so when I when I when I see that, like I said, I my my brain, it's a curse, really, that I can see symbols and like I immediately go. Tuk, 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 Pattern tuk, recognition, tuk. man. It's a thing. Well, whatever it is, I'm immediately imagining the repercussions of the message, which I know is not just existing on a t-shirt at Target. That is just letting me know this has been elevated to the level where somebody somewhere thinks there's commercial value to it, which means it spread pretty damn far. So yeah. that's why I get my backup and I think, oh crap. And I don't like that Target is doing it because Target has options. They can make t-shirts with anything they want on them to sell. And if that they choose to do this to me is pandering. So that is why I reacted. But it, I, it is no surprise to me when I open up my internet today. And I mean, it's not like news to a lot of people. This was happened a couple of days ago, but then I see this, which you probably saw because this is California and you're in California. Oh my God. This, oh, Bay yeah, Area, yeah. this Bay Area school district spent 250000 on woke kindergarten program. Test scores fell even further. And people might be saying, well, what do you what do you mean uh, woke, you know, woke uh, kindergarten? So, you know, head on over. And we have our good friend, Adam Coleman, who's observing this. He says, our tax dollars are used not only to put people into colleges for low value degrees based on inflated rates, but now they're funding an industry filled with mediocre graduates who tell sell their services based on hope and not results. And here is this individual, the founder of the Woke Kindergarten Consultancy recently awarded a $250,000 grant. This is what she says in this video. I'm not going to play it because I, I believe Israel has no right to exist. I believe the United States has no right to exist. I believe every settler settler colony who has committed genocide against the native people has no right to exist. She just keeps going on like that. And that is, you know, kind of how, how she operates. This one I am going to play. And I, hopefully you guys, if, if it's like echoey, let me know and I'll mute myself. But this is the woke kindergarten creator. Lisa Logan posted this is be, they're funded by uh, 4.0 schools, which is funded by Coke's stand together, Coke brothers, pushing school choice legislation. So there, you know, there's some like weird stuff going on. Micro schools that are forced to teach liberatory education in every subject everywhere is the goal. This is one of the things they're teaching. Get This is from woke kindergarten. Look at the imagery. Oh, hang on a second. Let me show you. Purple. Can you find the color purple? Red. Can you find the color red? Orange. 
Can you find the color orange? This is so insidious. Brown. Can you find the color brown? So this goes all the way through the alphabet and with, you know, or, or all the, not the alphabet, it goes all the way through the colors and all the imagery is negative. Literally all of it. And then we go over to this. This is from Woke Kindergarten. All power to the little people. Woke Kindergarten is a global abolitionist early childhood ecosystem and visionary creative portal supporting children, families, educators, and organizations in their commitment to abolitionist early education and pro-black and queer and trans liberation. And what I want you guys to understand is that when they say abolition, they mean what they say. They absolutely mean it. Hear them in their own words. But mostly in respect to the police or to prisons or to the carceral state, abolition of police or abolition of prisons. But what does it mean for school? Are we talking about abolishing school? Yeah. Did you hear that? <laughs> Are we talking about abolishing school? <laughs> yeah. Okay, then. So they're, they're not even anymore talking about slavery or abolishing oppression, you know, prisons, police, and school. Let's just yeah, that sounds, that sounds like a great school, idea, doesn't it? School is white supremacy, which leads you to, you know, being on time is white supremacy. I mean, we we can and should laugh and mock, but we also should, should understand how insidious this is and how this is tied to all collectivism, which is about destroying the West. And that brings me to say that just brought up something that I really want to bring home. What I saw in my 21 years um, watching my kids go through school and this this rot coming in, it is completely dovetailed with the rise of what uh, Abigail Schreier called the you know um, social contagion part of transgenderism. Yep. Because when you spend every day telling your white students, and again, America is a majority white country, and in LA, even in LA County. You know, black people are m maybe 6% in the city of LA, like 9%, like not a huge percent of the population. You tell them they're worthless. How do they get points? Yep. Well, it's pretty easy if you're, especially if you're a gay kid, to be like, well, I'm trans, which is, by the way, the most anti gay. It, it, it is yeah. conversion therapy. And I can't believe people haven't cottoned on to that yet. Exactly. Um, and so that's what's going on. It's all together. And that's why I beseech people to be a little brave. Say, I feel like this is racist if they're trying to put an affinity group program in your school. Um, you People who spend th their highest and best good as progressives and people can be pro-choice, pro-life, whatever. I'm not here to debate that. But the highest and best good of the Democrat Party and all committed, good, God-fearing, Lululemon-wearing, Chardonnay-swilling, Tesla-driving, college-educated, white liberal women is reproductive health. You don't get to spend every spare dime you have electing people who will allow that reproductive health to happen in Black neighborhoods to Black children yep. to the point where you're, you're importing illegals from South America, because think about why is it that America's black people have never having, risen above 12% of the population? Because they're, they're being slaughtered in the womb. Yep. And that, and even when they do have children, because of all of the, the, the social welfare programs and everything that destroys the family, there's not that there's not that nurturing family that's going to reproduce the culture of having a family and, and so on and so forth. So you end up in positions where people are more inclined to have an abortion because they don't have the, you it, know, yeah, it's a, it's a horrible, it's horrible, a horrible cycle. And when you add stuff like this, we have abolitionist teaching. I mean, this is what they're about. And these people, I'm telling you the people behind these organizations are absolutely, this is what they're doing for Black History. Look, Black History Month events. They are in, I have a friend in New Jersey and she sent me things that like Abolitionist Teaching Network is behind their African-American Studies mandatory 
course that they have in their district. And almost all of the stuff they push in there is either Black Lives Matter or abolitionist stuff like this. Look at this. We do not play when it comes to Black History Month. All month, you know, we'll be hosting events to celebrate and learn from Black freedom struggles, education, historical figures, and modern day solidarity movements. That's communism. Guys, like solidarity equals communism. Like, let's be clear. And then we have, you know, um, all these different events that they're putting on. Black Freedom Schools panel, Black Lives Matter at school. What is Black Lives Matter at school, you might wonder? Well, let's take a look. What we do and how we done it. How we done it. A guide for Black Lives Matter at school. And this goes on. Let's see if I can get to the next one. So they've got the whole day of visibility, blah, blah. Look at the symbols. Collective, our collective, we're a black led. We, you know, they go through um, end zero tolerance, implement restorative justice, hire black teachers, mandate black history and ethnic studies. Can you imagine somebody coming through and saying, and, and I'm Jewish, but I don't want mandatory, you know, Jewish studies. Okay. I think people should learn about the Holocaust, but I really caution people the more you put this mandatory this and mandatory that, it it's not what we're about. Um, I think, I think the best way, look, we're all, we're all human. Yes. Every, it would just be great if everyone had a little grace, people are yes. going to speak and sometimes they're going to speak inartfully, Yeah. but we all have to share this planet and we all share this country That's and right. America's greatness is, and, and was, I mean, uh, uh, Barack Obama if he did nothing else as president, if he had said, black men, be like me, be a father to your children, marry the mother of your children, that would have made Black Lives Matter. I agree. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the one person would have, you know, I mean, it, I mean, it would have been good was, for him to but say. But he had the bully pulpit. Yeah. Right? It would have been like, nice if he didn't hand it to his pastor, like in his first year of office. Right. And and what's what's really infuriating and, and maddening is all these collectivist organizations, right? They're all, they're all getting the money from Soros, from Coke, from whoever. None of those people live that way. None of them encourage their kids to have kids out of wedlock or to not pay attention in school or to focus on their identity. They all encourage their, they encourage parsimony in financial matters, um, prudence in their lives, hard work in their, in industry. Nepotism. They, <laughs> yeah, they're taking all those things away yes. from yes. African-American. Yeah, kids they, they are. And they're teaching lessons that, you know, unapologetically black, who asked you to apologize? Like this idea that you have to unapologetically what you are. Um, black women, black families, intergenerational black villages, globalism. Okay. Uh, collective value, trans affirming, queer affirming. So these are the things that are going on in lieu they have a year of purpose. So it's not even just the month or the week. What they're doing this week in Black uh, Black Lives Matter in school is what they call their annual week of, of, of action. Notice it started today. And this is putting those guiding principles that I just showed you into, oh, I'm sorry, let me show you. This just started today. Um, they're putting their guiding principles into schools. Look, all these states that you see, This is these are participating states that are having this in their schools. So some people said to me, oh, well, that's probably just in New York or that's probably just in California or whatever. No, it's not. Look, Arkansas, Louisiana, Georgia, Florida, Illinois, Wisconsin. I mean, this is happening. People say all the time, oh, you live in California. Well, sucks to be you, but that doesn't affect me. No, California has, Kansas. Uh, has more people than any other state. And what we say actually goes because textbook publishers are not going to print two sets of books. So when California made um, uh, an ethnic studies curriculum, you think that hasn't gotten its way into your textbooks? Arkansas, it's in Utah. Nebraska, Utah. Yeah, it's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. There, and I mean, New Jersey is California on the East Coast. So I almost feel like they have an agreement. Like we're going to yeah. be, it's shaped the same way, just kind of backwards and a little shorter. You know, it's like, it's kind of like Dr. Evil and Mini-Me. You know, you, you have California 
<laughs> and New Jersey and New Jersey. And especially like right around Philadelphia, which is super ironic considering that's where our declaration of independence and our constitutional you know, convention was held. Anyway, um, that is the, like one of the worst districts for it, but this is kind of what's, what's going on. And this shows, uh, let me show you what they're doing over in Cherry Hill for black, for black history month. They're having an essay poster and video conference or not a contest rather, uh, open to all public school students in Cherry Hill grades K through 12. The theme is their stories matter. African-Americans in our schools and community. This is supposed to be black history month, but they are, you know, asking them to tell stories, um, about the people that are actually like right there in their community. Now, I'm not saying that's not some history. Okay, fine. But when you go through here, they ask the, them these kind of, um, they ask them questions about their dreams and so forth. And then as they get older, they get to, did racism, discrimination, or prejudice interfere with achieving your dreams or goals? Every, you know, so look, they're going to send people out to like find the racism. To say, oh, it's it's racism that that stopped me from accomplishing A, B, C, or D. And by the way, conservatives do this, like, oh, Roxanne, you must not be getting work because you're a conservative actress. No, eh, I'm not that good. Like, you know, I wasn't right for the part. Whatever. Like, I'm not I'm not going to ascribe to something outside of myself. What I, when I can only have control over the things that I am able to do, but right. it is it is stopping people. Look. <laughs> Black people don't have 100% approval ratings in their own families. No one does. So it's clearly not racism that that sometimes it's you're the jerk. There's a right. more colorful but way this, to say that. Like, this am I also, Yeah. This, this is so, bleeding into other things too, right, Roxanne? I mean, it's not. So the racism that they're fixated on and fixated on, you know, we have to have affinity groups for this and that and the other. It's it's affecting students of all different ethnicities and teaching them, I think, that segregation is okay, but now schools are coming in, aren't they, and saying, not for you, though. Like, it's okay for some people, as we saw just the other day, didn't we, with the Persian girls? Uh, yes, yes. Right? I know also, I know we're running short on time, and we wanted to um, address any of the questions or comments, but yes, yeah. there was a, a group of girls um, at school in L.A., who all want to eat together. We have a large Persian population here. Um, I think they may have been Persian Jews, but they're all friends and they all want to sit together. And because they were not a favored group, a lot, they got reprimanded and treated really badly by the school. Yeah, it's it's crazy. They actually separated them. Um they're saying, you know, this is incredibly detrimental. Your child is part of a group that has created an exclusive Persian table at lunch. This is incredibly detrimental to our school community, promotes exclusive environment, blah, blah, blah. Please note this will not be tolerated. Table will be dispersed, et cetera. I can tell you for a fact, these tables exist for black students. They create tables where it's like, you can't sit here. Oh, yeah. I've seen and, it. And My way, daughter's with, been shooed away from a table. With, with the school's blessing, They'll have like black girls lunch and parents will bring in and you'll love this because it was a big brouhaha over. Um, it just happened the first day of Black History Month. They uh, Some school district, uh, the cafeteria served like fried right, chicken, right. watermelon. So they had a group at our private school that was like the black kids lunch. And they get like they get free lunch from parents who volunteer to bring it in. Right. And the first day they brought in Popeye's fried chicken. And I was like. I know. And then, and then this comes up today and then it's like, Aramark apologizes for insensitivity of school lunch served for first day of Black History Month. They serve fried chicken, waffles, and watermelon. And as somebody pointed out in the comments, all I care about is where'd they get decent watermelon in February in New York? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, some farmer somewhere was really excited in some yeah. other place where they sent the watermelons, but they had to apologize and all this other stuff. And I'm thinking, what kid in their right mind wouldn't want fried chicken waffles and watermelon for yeah, lunch? Yeah, I mean, the kid with the gluten allergy, who's me. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> true. But what I'm saying is, like, can I you know. imagine? But my question is, Roxanne, what should they have served? So, you know, what if they serve pizza? That's so insensitive to serve Italian food and yeah, black That's the thing. You're damned if you do. You're damned if you don't. And I'll end with this. The only way to stop 
discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Without a doubt. Now, I know that you have to go. I want to let the audience know that while I, I'm so grateful to you for stopping by, that Roxanne's going to go. I'm going to stick around and go over some curriculum stuff and look at some other pedagogical th things that Roxanne is probably not really. <laughs> She's like, that's getting into the sausage. I'm not into it. But I am so grateful that you came and shared your thoughts with us about all of this and your experiences, what happened at your school, because it's another perspective. We need to get different perspectives um, on this. And I really appreciated you, you know, speaking up and, and saying something when I was getting the pile on, um, not just because it was nice to have somebody like defending me, but also I feel like we each have to do that. We have yeah. to just, so what if I was, okay, let's say, I was totally wrong. I'm a human being. And, and the way to get you to see the side that they wanted you to see is not to call you. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to even remember some of the names we got called. It was super fun. Um, yeah, it was but great. All you have to know, and, and, and here's the end result of all this name calling, all this acrimony and all this segregation. People now are more racist than they used to be. They just keep it quiet. They're like, well, I know why those black kids are, you know, uh, I know why that woman was hired as a black principal. I know why that person is a black pilot. I know why that yep. person, right? That's what they have made. And people are just sick of it. They're absolutely sick of it. And it means nothing when, uh, you know, my white mother who married my black father was called a racist for not supporting Obama. Yeah. It lost, it's lost all meaning. Yeah, it's true. It, it, and I, that's a great great point to end on. So thank you for stopping by. Please come back anytime. It was a, a pleasure. It was a pleasure to meet you. It was a pleasure to have you here. And I, as I said, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to go through some wit and wisdom curriculum. Uh, for those of you in the chat, I'm going to look at the some actual papers on Black Joy. <laughs> there are actually Which, research papers. In fact, Joy. Right. And there's um, some things I just want to show you guys for context if you're interested in it. Uh, stick around because especially the um, the wit and wisdom curriculum, I think you you might find interesting how they embed this stuff into a curriculum so that you you know somebody can go what it's just grammar what is your problem oh my god you're so paranoid <laughs> and oh, then when no, you no, like no. look and in the weeds it's you're also, like Wait. it's CRT it's DEIJ it's social emotional learning it's, it's all the what, things. It's mental health like just be on the lookout for all those bud words I'm actually heading out in this terrible rain uh, to go uh, be on Fox News at night with Trace Gallagher tonight this is not a partisan issue it's an American issue every yeah. American citizen should be proud of our country and learn all of its history. All exactly. of it. Exactly. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you so much. Drive safe in the rain and have Thank a great, you. have a great show. All right. See you later. Okay. So guys, let me, uh, let me go back over your, your, your chats here. Uh, okay. What do we got? What do we got? Oh, thank you so much, Adrian, for moderating. I probably was worried about nothing, but you know, you know how it can get. Um, so you're saying that the, uh, the DEI, uh, person that they have at Harvard is also a plagiarist. I missed that. I missed that. Wait, where, let me see. Do, 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 do. Where did you say that? So yeah, that the, they're the latest plagiarist. Oh my goodness. And I saw they also just appointed a new, um, president of the Harvard law review, a black woman who says that she too is going to focus on, you know, some of these issues, but like, in other words, they've learned nothing. Um, and then let's see, what if a person's history is wrapped up in their identity such that the two get mixed? That's a really good question. I think my take on that is that we still should be encouraging children in particular to focus on history and the important points of history that are universal that can teach us all something rather than identity. And I'm going to... Um, suggest that everybody watch the interview with Coleman Hughes and, um, and the, uh, objective standard, I think it was objective or was it Ayn Rand's, uh, Institute, I think it was Ayn Rand Institute where he talks about, um, individuals versus these group identities. And I still think that it's really watch it. I'll, I'll pull it up and I'll show you, but it's really important. Um, Amarok says racial segregation month, divide us as much as they can. So the Rich, I think you mean rich and powerful can have control over us. Yes, in a nutshell. Yes. 
Um, oh yeah, there you said it. Slavery light. <laughs> right. It's there are people who believe that that there was like harder slavery and easier slavery, and that's just completely crazy. Adrian says, heck, if I'm half Irish, but I can't stand those shirts. I'm wondering which shirt I would wear. Do I have like a shirt that looks like kind of a pizza where like half of it's Jewish and the other half of it is like Scottish, French, and a bunch of other stuff? Like what, you know, are we not more than the sum of our parts? Like, are we, are we a salad or a milkshake? I'd rather be a milkshake. Um, the sheriff scene in Blazing Saddles. That movie could not get made today, right? Am I right? That movie cannot be, get made today. I was sharing, if you guys are not following me on Twitter, I was sharing some links to some Legends of Chamberlain Heights episodes. If you've never seen that show, you have missed out. They canceled it after two seasons. It was on Adult Swim and it was like tears streaming down your face. Funny. It really pokes fun at all of these stereotypes, but like in a in a good way, in a in a in a I thought it was in a great way. And I posted a couple of them and you should you should go check them out. But look up um Adult Swim Legends of Chamberlain Heights. And you know who's still running them on YouTube? <laughs> Adult Swim, I think it's a or no comedy channel, Africa. Africa. <laughs> it's still playing them, but not the United States. Um think how stupid the average person is, then realize that half of them are stupider than that, to paraphrase Georgia. Yes. Very true. Um, you know what, Adrian? You're talking about, I think, with the EEOC and the diversity hiring stuff that's going on, like Mark Cuban. Yes, people do need to file suit. I, I don't know why they're not doing it. it drives me crazy. Um, and yes, this is very important too. You need to figure out your telos. Joy is also deeper than happiness. Yes. Meaning, purpose, purpose. Now, Black Lives Matter will tell you, well, we do a year of purpose, but what you notice is you read between the lines and all the things they suggest you have purpose about are struggle, are, you know, something in relation to people who are not black. This alleged, you know, white supremacy, blah, blah, colonization, all of that type of stuff. It's not within you. It's not going to be chosen just by you. It's going to be dictated by the collective. The hero is toil and toil is... Uh, unthinkable outside the collective. Um, let's see. Let, da, 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 da. What do you want to abolish? WhatsApp? God. I'm not really sure I understand, but as far as what I want to abolish, um, I would like to abolish the Federal Reserve, the income tax, the 16th Amendment, the 17th Amendment, <laughs> um, government schooling, <laughs> most of the alphabet agencies. I've got a long, long list, but you know, the police and education in general are not not on it. Um, yeah, the communist fist is prominently featured in all of Black Lives Matter and abolition, uh, education, uh, black liberation education. It's prominently there, even in black joy. I do think it also screws the kids over Adrian. Very true. Um, so let's see. Okay. So now Dorothy is, is just arrived. Hi, Dorothy. Just tuned in. Looks like I missed a ton. Just curious. What's the significance of mentioning she's Jamaican born? You know, believe it or not, the main significance for that is that she was attacked specifically when when I was attacked for taking issue with Target's uh, Black Joy campaign for Black History Month. Um, she jumped in and said she thought that the racial essentialism of the message um, was was racist. Like she didn't like it either. She felt like it was segregation, a sort of neo-segregationist. And she was attacked for being Jamaican and not really being Black. Like she's not a dose, therefore, you know, she's not. So she puts, she puts in her bio that she's Jamaican born um, because, you know, first of all, it's just true. She is, you know, was not born in this country, but she's very proud now to be an American. So you could consider her an, an immigrant. And yet she gets treated like garbage because she's Jamaican born whenever she tries to speak up about racial issues. So it is sort of relevant to the conversation in that respect that identity is getting so important that people are getting onto you're not that kind of black person, you're not the right kind of black person, et cetera. What it, because she doesn't hold opinions that people like. Um, America is saying, just wanted to say, I live in Wales, yet the issues you cover are all relevant here. When America sneezes, the Brits catch a cold. Very true. And I'm sorry. <laughs> If I could stop that, if I could send you some, you know, like some Kleenex or something, I, I, I am 
very, very sorry. And I have a little teeny bit of Welsh blood. So does that mean I have some like Welsh identity? I have Scottish, Welsh, um, some English. I got a bunch of that. Uh, let's see. And oh, spell checker ruined your James Dean joke. You'll have to clue me in. Um, so what I wanted to do now, we Ro Roxanne and I talked about, and Dorothy, I'm sorry you missed it. Maybe you'll be able to go back. We talked just about um, her story with her private school and what she'd observed as far as the, the sort of neo-segregation of the kids into these affinity groups within the schools and so on. I showed some stuff about what Black, what Black History Month was originally supposed to be about history um, and cultural sharing for all of us because we're all Americans. So it's also our history. The contributions that people who were brought here in chains or who even emigrated to come here who are black, the contributions they've made to our country are now things we all benefit from, right? So that's what it was originally supposed to be is to celebrate that because there wasn't enough focus on it, you know, during the rest of the year, because most of our history that's written down in the books is about predominantly European ethnicities and, you know, white skinned people, whatever. So it just kind of does, doesn't get covered as much a tiny minority. It would be like, as she pointed out, what if we had, you know, Jewish history month or this history month or Chinese history month, we could theoretically do them all. But the black history month specifically was the brainchild of Carter Woodson. And it was, and he did it not so much as a, as a thumbing his nose to everybody else. It was more like, Hey, let's make sure that, uh, that we include this, that it was true inclusion, that it doesn't get lost in the shuffle because we don't have enough time in school to go over it. So let's take responsibility as, as a people and produce something special and extra on our own. And every, since 1976, every president, every White House, every administration has recognized it and actually contributed to it. So you know, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing, except I think it's becoming a bad thing because it's being turned into a way for activists to it push a kind of identity segregation. So, but the question then becomes, how do they do it? Like on a daily basis, you can't just wake up February 1st and get people to buy into the notion that you got to segregate into these little identity groups. Not in the United States of America, they're supposed to be a melting pot. So what is the process that we're, you know, whereby they get kids, little kids, to then grow up to be the kind of people who attacked me because how dare a white woman comment on what Target's doing for Black History Month? Well, I can because I'm an American and I have a right to speak and it has nothing to do with what I look like or what race I have. So the way that it gets done is through groups, as I was pointing out and started to get into, through groups that are very active in teaching in our schools, like the Abolitionist Teaching Network. Abolitionist Teaching Network and Black Lives Matter in School, they push curriculum that actually finds its way into your school. What does that look like? Uh, well, I showed a little bit of the Black History Month stuff. Um, I'm going to show it to you again, a little more of it, like their year of purpose material. They look at, they go through the whole year and this would go kindergarten all the way up. So it's not just Black History Month where they're focusing on, you know, the abolition day, commemorate George Floyd's birthday and commit to lifting up the names and memories of our beloved ancestors. George Floyd is a beloved ancestor in the global struggle against state violence, the global struggle. And notice they say state violence, but I don't see anybody talking about the black people in bondage in the Middle East. Then they have recognized black trans lives taken and those who, authentic, uh, who authentically lived like William Swan Dorsey. So they have these all geared around sort of death, remembrance, very kind of maudlin type of things. And this is for kids. Um, year of purpose. They have all kinds of resources and curriculum guides teaching materials. Look, there's a Black Lives Matter principles activity book, teaching for black lives book by rethinking schools. There's so many materials that teachers can go and get for free to put in their schools all year long. What we believe, who is we, who is going to come into the classroom? And it's not all black children in the classroom. This is all children in a classroom. Who is going to go in there and say, who's we? Why did you rope me into this? What if I don't believe this? What if I don't, am I allowed to not agree with you or does that make me a racist? I don't agree with black joy. Apparently they're claiming that that makes me a terrible person and a racist. 
I'll show you what black joy is. You be the judge, but you know, um, black lives matter is message is embedded in the way I teach already. Everyone is valued. So why not set aside time for one group of, pe of people and not others? Here's their answer. Why even the teacher who says I embed it into everything I do already, they want you to go farther. That's so important. But this is not about respect and kindness. This is about unpacking your backpack of privilege with your students. Now imagine the teacher standing at the front of the room, having a little struggle session with him or herself. And now the student gets the message, I'm supposed to do this too, because that's the teacher. If they're doing it, well, certainly the student's supposed to do it. Relying on colorblind rhetoric around kindness and tolerance only perpetuates the issues at hand and does nothing to challenge structural racism and white supremacy. Structural racism, America, non-communist, democratic, you know, like representative republic America. That's what they mean by structural racism. Literally, get rid of it. And white supremacy, that just means not communism. I mean, basically what they want is communism. Globalism, decolonialism, degrowth, all the things. They just want to tear everything down that is. Everything that is equals white supremacy. Everything that is equals structural racism. That's all that's code for. The integration into your, you know, what place does Black Lives Matter have in our daily curriculum, not just during Black History Month? The integration into your daily curriculum of culturally diverse opinions, it's not culturally diverse opinions. It isn't. You're not allowed to have an opinion that is different. I could not, if I were a child, I could not go in there and have a Zionist opinion about what's going on in the Middle East right now. And the main reason I could not is that the Black Lives Matter official position is pro Hamas, basically. It's pro Palestine, not a two state solution. And I'm going to show you, I have proof that that is the case. Um, right here, this is, and this unfortunately is like showing all kinds of junk. Sorry. Uh, this person, Sydney Rose, I don't know who they are, but she, uh, is a big, uh, player in sort of the the abolitionist movement, very big into black joy and so forth. I uh, got her name and her information from somebody that follows all of this and these notifications are going to drive me insane. Um but look at the look at the imagery that she's got on her Facebook here. Free Palestine, look at this. Does that look like someone who wants a two-state solution? Or does that look like somebody who wants the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim mosque to be the center of everything? No Jews at all. Stop the genocide. We're also into banned books over here. So there is synergy with anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, et cetera. Very, very big symmetry involved with that. And so they are not really interested in diverse opinions. Um, then we have all kinds of student creative challenges. These challenges are a form of training the kids to be activists. They're, they're, what makes you feel free to dream, safe to thrive in schools and communities? What makes you feel safe? Implication, you're not safe most of the time, so you got to go find things to be safe about, um, and so on. Is this, isn't this too emotionally stressful for students? That's a valid question. Can we rely, can we really open up a sensitive conversation even though we can't devote legitimate time to this issue? Students are confronting these issues on a daily basis. So all the students have to suffer because some of the students might be suffering somewhere. Maybe not in this classroom, but somewhere. You might even have a school where there are, you know, there's one black child or no black children. They're all Hispanic, let's say. Or they're, you know, I mean, this they're all Asian. In Chinatown, in New York City, something like that. And they will still be doing this. So the, the 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 issue is not making some people feel safe. Whatever. It's about making everybody understand their place. It is a form of segregation. So then I wanted to find out what, you know, they're talking about Black Joy in the Target account, the, in the Target stuff. And, you know, people are wondering, well, what is that? Isn't it just a good thing? So somebody did this for me. Within the context of critical race theory and race Marxism, what is black joy and why would it be revolutionary? Sound of the person did contextualize it with within the context. 
but I'll show you how even outside, the, like even without that qualification, there are people writing papers about it. Critical race theory, CRT, this is chat GPT saying this, and race Marxism are distinct intellectual traditions that analyze the intersections of race power in society. Well, critical race theory emerged and blah, blah, blah. We know all this. Black joy is a concept that has gained prominence within discussions related to race and social justice. So it is a social justice concept. It is not exclusive to CRT or race Marxism, but aligns with the broader discourse on racial empowerment and resistance. It is intricately connected with the notion of resistance being central to the black experience. Resistance against what? White people and capitalism and you know anything that isn't communist, basically. Resistance against everything that America stands for. So we have that. Then I went looking for some more info because that was like, okay, it's in relation to resistance. What else can you tell me? Came across this. He says, my latest is in print. I've been tinkering with thoughts for this piece for a couple of years, attempting to work out a complex rendering of joy situated in black critical thought, critical thought, critical theory, and praxis. It's open access if you, you know, if you want to look. So I said, oh yes, I do. Thank you very much. And went over there to find it. Unspeakable joy, anti-black constraint, loopholes of retreat, and the practice of black joy. And when you read this abstract, it becomes even more clear that this is existing in a in in a the framework of resistance. So um it says this manuscript with Harriet Jacobs, I am concerned with the otherwise worlds, the productions of black joy that black people devise while in the crawl space understood here as higher education contexts. Is higher education the crawl space? I'm a little confused about the language. I'm not trying to make fun. I genuinely don't understand that. Whereas the condition of black life is in an antagonistic relationship with society. So this is a key point here. Whereas the condition of black life is in an antagonistic relationship with society. Now that's his view. And in the United States, he's entitled to it. My contention is that this view is being presented to children as fact. It's the same criticism we had of critical theory and critical race theory specifically, is that this is not just somebody's study, somebody's opinion, somebody's you know theory that they're advancing. This is something presented to children as it's been decided. And in public schools, no less. I ask, what is the sound, look, and feeling of black joy, unspeakable joy, or what I define as the proxies of internal elaboration, cramped creation, and otherwise imagining are loopholes for black people to extricate the self from untenable antagonisms. So this notion that black people are being constantly antagonized, I'm sure they think I'm doing it now. I'm asking questions. I'm positing that this might not be a great thing for children to be exposed to, especially black children, to be taught that their lives exist in untenable antagonisms and that their joy, you know, that having to, they have to extricate themselves from these before they can experience joy. I don't personally find that to be um, healthy. But, you know, I, I, again, I come from a Jewish background. Jewish people were oppressed. There are still Jewish people being oppressed in this world. Nowhere in the history of my life did anyone tell me that my joy was contingent on extricating myself from untenable antagonisms of anti-Semitism. No, at no point in time did anybody say because your ancestors were either, you know, in gulags or slaves or chased away from their homes by Cossacks or straight up murdered in gas chambers are you having to like find safe spaces and home spaces, home, you know, home places to, to be able to experience joy. That just, that just never happened. And I'm not saying that makes me a better person in and of itself. I'm just grateful that never happened because I never, I feel like that would have been a burden to see other people and other experiences and all my relationships as, you know, with people who were not Jewish as just untenably antagonistic under the threat of suffocation, uh, Harry Jacobs dwelled in a crawl space for seven years with little space to maneuver her body, recalling the crawl space of a confinement, a small shed in her grandmother's house. So this is literal. Uh, Jacobs recorded how the antebellum soundscape engendered thoughts of wonder, terror, and joy. So if we're speaking about like a very specific person there, okay, this makes sense. 
What I don't understand is like in that person's context, I get it completely. I still, I've read accounts of the Holocaust and people being like locked in attics and little crawl spaces and hiding from certain death, you know, at the hands of the Germans. And I still never read anything that was about, you know, I can't feel joy because of this or I have to extricate myself. And, and I may be misunderstanding. So I went and I looked into it some more theory into practice. So now we come over to something called home place and black joy in K-12 education. Here are the number, these are all different papers and all different articles rather about teaching home place. This is a new term for me. Just found this today. I do not profess to be an expert on this, but again, I want you guys to know what's being discussed about our children and what's being talked about as far as what should be taught in schools, because you need to go look into this and decide like, do I agree with this? And should this be taught in schools as fact? Should teachers be immersed in this? Teaching home place, how teachers can cultivate black joy through culturally responsive practices in the classroom. Well, we know culturally responsive pra practices are another sort of code term for CRT. Critical theory, power and privilege. The world isn't divided into these things and it's a zero sum game. That's what we're talking about. Um, there's no place like home space. School principal's role in developing student belonging as resistance against oppression. Student belongings often centered in these affinity groups that they say that's what they're for. So they can feel a sense of belonging in the school environment. Well, who said they weren't? Who said they didn't belong? Why do they need to sequester themselves and segregate themselves to belong? So you can only belong with people who look like you. And that's your that's how you deal with, that's how you resist oppression. Nobody's trying to oppress you. But if you teach children, that's what is happening. School is trying to oppress you. And this is why you need this belonging of these affinity groups. Now, if they said, we need to stress that the students belong in the whole and that that's a resistance to any kind of potential oppression of somebody singling them out and saying, well, you're black and you know I'm white, that would make more sense to me. Let's make sure we all, you know, we're all part of the same school. We all belong here. Nobody's more special or different than anybody else. We're, we're all Americans. We're all students in the school. We're all first graders, whatever we are. But this strikes me as a kind of emotional segregation. You, your joy is contingent on it. So again, I, you know, I have to I have to find out like more about what home place is. So I came to this. Uh, this comes from Black Youth Mental Health, Understanding and Being Culturally Responsive to remote, Promote Home, Place, and Black Joy. Apparently, these two things go together. So looking through this, I come down to this part. Home Place as Bell Hooks. Okay, so it goes back to Bell Hooks, 1990. Describes, um, as Bell Hooks describes, is a sanctuary space that is humanizing, loving, and full of grace. It is an intentional space, a safe space that is cultivated to welcome healing and warmth that encourages growth and wholeness. This all sounds fabulous, but for the implicit flip side, the opposite of every one of these words, let's read them and see how it sounds. Sanctuary space, unsafe space, risky space, humanizing, dehumanizing, loving, hating, full of grace, no grace, an intentional space, an unintentional space. An un a safe space, an unsafe space that is cultivated, that is random to reject instead of welcome, healing, okay, sickness, I guess, coldness that discourages growth and, you know, presumably encourages brokenness. So that's what I want everybody to understand is if you're going to call this up, we're going to encourage this, we're going to do this, but you're implying not so subtly all the things I just said that were the opposite. That the school, for example, is unwelcoming, rejecting, lacks grace, is a, a place people who are unwell or broken cannot heal, can, it, it dehumanizes. And I'm just baffled because, again, I grew, I went to public school through ninth grade. I grew up in the 70s and, and early 80s. I graduated high school in 83. And I just do not remember the environment. And we had black students in my school. I was not in a segregated school. Um, I do not remember school being rejecting. I do not remember it being racist. I do not remember any of this. And I have a pretty good memory. 
And maybe you guys in the comments can tell me if you're roughly, you know, in your 40s and 50s, did you feel like, you know, you went to schools where it was like hostile and rejecting and cold and, you know, encouraged brokenness and, and so forth and so on? So it just, it's that taking children and telling them that this is why they need black joy. It's like saying, if you don't have, if you don't do this, if you don't focus on this, you're in this hostile place. And I just don't see the evidence for that. I really don't. And I don't think the, you know, less than optimal outcomes academically are de facto evidence of this kind of rejecting space. I don't think they're de facto evidence of racism, period except in so far as you have the low expectations, the soft bigotry of low expectations that we're, you know, we're not going to really focus on teaching you to read and hold you back if you didn't do it. We're not going to be, you know, uh, tough with the teaching on, you know, math and so forth for all the students, by the way, because, well, it's too hard for you. Or like the tweet that I shared about the educator where the, the woman said, oh, well, you know, your students are invited to come to our group uh, you're because of at risk and so on and so forth. And I'm going to grab that again, wherever it was. Um, yeah, here we go. This one, in case you forgot, or you just joined, this is a, a black educator and she's the sponsor of the black student union. Now student unions typically are, you know, just organizations of students. Um, and she says, without hesitating, she invited my students to attend her motivating program for at risk students just assumed that's racist. The do-goodery stuff about, oh, we'll help you at-risk child who has black skin, that's racist. Assuming they need that. So, you know, this is the part that I don't get. Um, then let me show you. Okay, so we got through home space, um, a home place rather, not home space. And here's some more examples. We have things, you know, four black girls. Is there something like specific? Can you imagine this with, you know, four white girls? That'd be super weird. I just, I don't understand it. Now, I don't have a problem with it. It's not, it like, again, it's not about me being excluded, okay? Or my daughter's being excluded. It's more, I'm wondering what the message is to people if you tell them they need this. How do you ever full, fully integrated lives? How do you feel truly like, like you belong where you are that isn't an exclusively black place? Um, that's what I'm wondering. And here we have something that somebody posted. It says, blacks can't excel in AP math and science classes. So a Virginia school district created an AP class in black joy. This will increase AP credits for black students artificially. So they're getting, they're literally going to get college credit for taking a class in black joy. So while your kids take AP calculus and this person, I don't like the way this person talks. I do not approve of somebody calling it the Browns, but this is what you get. I'm sorry. This is what happens when people start segregating and going, you know, black girls and black joy and black, you'll get people like no juice for me. Thanks. With whom I do not agree in terms of their assessment and the, the Brown. I don't like that talk. That is rude. That is racist. But that they posted this, and this is legit about this AP thing. Okay. South County High Inside an AP African American Studies class. This is in a high school. By the way, this is in violation of Florida law. Florida law is explicitly anti CRT, anti, you know, they're not supposed to teach these kind of racially segregated things. The way they're getting around the law is by putting it into an AP class. Oh, it's a college class. So we can do it. So not only are they going to get college credit for basically studying something that is segregated, this is not for white students, they are going around a law that was meant to prevent this kind of racial essentialism in the school. Now, that I don't necessarily agree with trying to ban ideas from a school. I would much rather, now that it's out there, the toothpaste is out of the tube. I would rather have the schools in Florida say, all right, let's address this head on. How many of you agree with that there's, the world is divided into power? How many of you do know? Let's have a conversation, especially in high school. Talk about it. Let's talk about it. 
have a debate, have a robust debate, make it absolutely safe for all the students to share their views. And even if it's two thirds of the class, it goes, yes, it is in power privilege, whatever. As long as that other third can safely say, no, I totally disagree. And here's why. And as long as they're reading Thomas Sowell right along with Ibram X. Kendi, you know, not because they're forced to, but they're encouraged to. That's all I care about. But I think banning is, I don't, it doesn't work as we've seen. Uh, but, and I think you, you're not going to put the ideas away. You're just not going to get rid of them. Um, Eli Steele posted this. It says Pew Research asks how black adults find joy as if there's a black joy versus a human joy. It's almost as if they're studying blacks, as if there were some exotic species out in the wild. Joy is human, period. I completely agree. This is this is where I was coming from. I mean, look at this. They're actually studying this. Black adult, no, black adults include those who say their race is black alone, not blah, 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 blah. I mean, they're I just can't imagine being studied like that. Um and it does come, somebody says, this also comes from the endless, no one can understand the black experience brought up, up so often in discussions of race. And I'm sure I'm gonna get pushed back that, you know, you don't understand white lady and you don't get it and this isn't for you and you did it. Okay, this is my country too. We all live here together and we're gonna have to continue to coexist peacefully or things are gonna get very ugly very fast. And I don't want that for anyone. I don't want it for me, for my kids, for your kids, for you. I don't want it for anybody. I think we need to get back to a place where we show each other grace and we do not look at each other as other. But as Americans, as individuals, not it's not even as much as like, you know, white people and black people are like coexisting peacefully side by side. No, just people. Just individuals, because I mean, who are we really anyway underneath this skin? Like I said, you know, I got you know half Jewish, and then some Scottish, and there's a little this, a little that. You've got people who are you know, mom is black and dad is white, or vice versa, or you know, somebody is, I mean, Chinese and black. I mean, it is ridiculous to arbitrarily assign identities to people based on like a a little color card an amount of melanin in their skin or maybe, you know, a nationality that their parents have or a language they speak at home when they're all Americans. Um, and that brings me to back to curriculum. So one of the ways that this gets reinforced on the day to day, because not every teacher is doing Black Lives Matter in the school, thankfully, lots are, but I'll tell you what a lot of them are doing. Almost all. They're not all using wit and wisdom. But I would say, since every school district has an equity plan, literally every single one, I don't care where you are, how red your state is, you have an equity plan per the federal government's mandate as of Barack Obama. And the odds are very high, no, it's 100%, that you have some kind of DEI statement on your school's website. You may not if it's a charter, but take a look. Even though it's a charter, they're public schools and they often do, but they all have an equity plan. They have to. So... The curriculum they use is likely to be focused on equity in some way, shape, or form. This is wit and wisdom. Wit and wisdom is very widely used. Ramona happens to be in Rhode Island. This was also in use in Tennessee and, uh, and other states. I don't remember off the top of my head how many other states, but this, if you recall, was the curriculum that they were, were using in Tennessee. And there are things in it I'm going to show you that you'll see are clearly in violation of Tennessee's law about about this sort of thing and moms for liberty challenged it it got spun as they want to get rid of ruby bridges no they don't they wanted to get rid of the treatment of ruby bridges that was contained within this curriculum and i'm going to show you why before we do that though i want to thank loan dissenter thank you so so much um, for your super chat, first time watching your live streaming your non Twitter content. This is excellent coverage and analysis. Hoping you get a wider audience. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate it, and I'm glad you're here. So, um, and I will come back to the chat once I go through the wit and wisdom. So, as you're watching this, if you have questions, comments, everything about what I'm about to show you, please drop them in the chat. So, this is for eighth grade, uh, module four, teens as change agents. So, there's there's your first hint. W they're eighth graders. They're barely teens. Okay. First of all, second of all, do we send our children to school to become change agents, to become activists, or do we send our children to school to get an education themselves individually? If they decide 
on their own at some point in life that they would like to go out and be an activist for something super. But we don't send them to school to be trained to do that. We don't send them to school to be encouraged to do that even. That's just not the job of the school or the teachers or anybody in the government's employee. Think of the conflict of interest of having the state and the state's employees training your child to be a political activist. I mean, just sit with that one for a little minute. All right. So she says, hundreds of hours of study modules like this one have replaced literature. Now, Ramona was a literature and history teacher. That is her thing, literature. That's her like greatest love. Um, so she knows her stuff. Instead of literature, students are providing provided instruction on how to be activists. Imagine the poor 12, 13, 14 year olds listening to this content every day there at school. And I'm going to make it larger. So here, you know, as again, you say, how do teens affect social change? Nowhere in this is the, the thought that, you know, maybe teens shouldn't. The framing, how do teens affect social change? It's presumed they do. It's not even open to discussion about whether they do or they don't. All right, moving on. She says, under the guise of justice, Students are taught how to apply activist strategies from the civil rights movement. This sort of DEI social justice content dominates K-12 education and appears across the disciplines in each grade. So here we go again. I'm going to try to make this a little bigger so you can see it. Okay. Notice a few things. The very explicit direction to the teacher. This is from the teacher's manual. Focusing question. No need to think, teacher. This is what you're going to say. What strategies do people use to affect social change? This is eighth grade. This is also literature. Content framing question lesson two is we're just going to spoon feed this to you. No. How do module texts build my knowledge? Craft questions lesson 24. Execute. How do I assess sources in a Socratic seminar? How do I present findings succinctly in a Socratic seminar? And you might think Socratic seminar, that's good. They're going to ask lots of questions. But the framing is so explicit around what questions to ask, it ceases to be a Socratic seminar. They're using that term incorrectly. It's not what it looks like. Um, it says the Socratic seminar is not only the culminating Socrat Socratic seminar of module four, but the final seminar of the grade eight students have the opportunity to apply their understanding of key concepts. In other words, regurgitate what they were told in a new way through examining the concept of justice in their, on their, in their own independently researched sources. They're not independently researched. They're given the materials, but we'll get there. Um, students return to the definition of justice recorded in their vocabulary journals and revise that definition based on their current understanding. So we're going to spend the rest of the module teaching them what we say justice means, and then they're going to go back and put in the new definition because they probably started with one that's more like the real one, and we're going to tell them what it really is, and they're going to go back and fix that. So, you know, that's really what it's about. Then moving on. <clears throat> Identify elements of effective strategies for social change from the articles, such as getting a large number of people involved in a social change movement. Are we going to do literature at any point in time in this? I mean, maybe, no, not really. Answer the framing question. Distill, what are the central ideas about the strategies for creating social change in two informational articles? Student write, students write an exit ticket. I mean, leaving aside that this is boring AF. I know students have been in these classes and they're like, I hate it. It's so horrible. It's boring. They are teaching, rather training, the students to be administrators. So you read this, you check off like, okay, what am I supposed to do? I have to identify. I have to name. I have to check a box. I have to write a thing out. I have to copy thing. I have to read this. I have to define these are very administrative tasks. There's not a lot of thinking going on here. If students have trouble coming up with an analogy, consider revisiting their work with figurative language and the role of comparisons and clarifying ideas. Additionally, have students generate analogies for familiar concepts before applying their understandings to this. They're having them read Malcolm Gladwell in literature. This is adult material. There are adults who struggle with Gladwell. I mean, he's not that hard, but it's just, you know, these are these are concepts and questions that require 
a level of background knowledge of the things that you're talking about that an eighth grader simply doesn't have because it's never been taught to them yet. What was I learning in eighth grade? Literature. We were reading things like, you know, the yearling. <laughs> uh, you know, and we were we in history or social studies, uh, American history, eighth grade. Okay. The word uprising is embedded in the grammar lesson on gerunds. Is that what you would think of when you think of teaching gerunds, uprising? I don't know. It's not really the first word that comes to mind when I think of teaching gerunds because it's not really in the day-to-day -day vocabulary of an eighth grader. Running, playing, gaming, eating, sleeping, talking, texting, <laughs> laughing, singing. Many, 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 many things I can think of for gerunds, but not uprising. Now you might say, but Deb, this whole book was about, you know, going back to the very beginning. This was called, you know, teens and change agents. Grade eight, wit and wisdom. I see that. I'm questioning why there is a unit that is called that even for Black History Month. Couldn't they have a literature Black History Month with Zora Neale Hurston? No. Is that a problem? Couldn't they read one of Frederick Douglass's speeches? That would at least dovetail with American history, which they're supposed to be learning. Am I a crazy person? I mean, this is what I would be doing if I were a teacher and allowed to actually teach my way and not handed wit and wisdom and told, do this. So she says, there's no part of a child's education that is not influenced by social justice ideology. None. Every moment a child is at school is filled with DEI indoctrination. If you wonder where the hate and violence comes from, look at K-12 education, then blame the U.S. Department of Education along with the AFT, American Federation of Teachers, and the NEA, and your state Department of Education, and all sorts of things. Parents who don't pay any attention to any of this going on, et cetera. Uh, so here we have... Here's the text that they're reading. Social media sparked accelerated Egypt's sparked and accelerated Egypt's revolutionary fire. That's the text in literature. They're reading about social media and the, you know, Egyptian uprising. Okay. How do gerunds work? <laughs> uh, which of the following answers explains the function of the underlined word? I'm still stuck on uprising. And then we get down to it. My brother attends dancing lessons. I know she gets exercise for dancing every day. Okay, that seems a little bit more age appropriate, but we had to start with uprising. Strong Thai activism and other types of activism are taught to 13 and 14 year old children. By the time children get to college, they are pros at activism and discrimination. This is all your child does at school. Everything revolves around protesting. That's a fact. It just is. But I mean, I, I will take you back uh, and, you know, to just once again, week of action. This is for schools. They do this in school. They have, you know, what they're going to do each day. In this, And look at all the states. Monday, restorative justice, loving engagement, black women. Number two, you know, Tuesday, diversity, globalism, collective value. Wednesday, trans affirming, queer affirming, empathy. <laughs> Thursday, intersectional, black families, black villages. And Friday, unapologetically black for an entire week, they were going to do this. And then as I pointed out to you, we had the um, abolitionist teaching network. The, lots of teachers follow this. Lots of teachers, like 18,000 followers here. And a lot of teachers follow this and they have all kinds of things. So it's not just black history month. They also have, you know, educators stop cop city meeting, a meeting for educators to learn how to bring the stop cop city movement to their classrooms, not their teacher group, their classrooms. This is aimed at teachers. Why would it be aimed at you? Why is something called Abolitionist Teaching Network? Okay. Highlander School in Atlanta, Georgia. This is coming up. Then we have more things. You don't want to know what Lambda is. Actually, you do. Go look it up. LGBTQ resources. We have LGBTQ. Right. These are K-12 teachers grant celebration. We're hiring grant writers. Oh, they get lots of grants. Remember the quarter of a million dollar grant that our friend woke kindergarten, uh, woke kindergarten got, but let's get back to Ramona and the curriculum. All right. So strong tie activism. What are we talking about here? 
So we're talking about students share the responses. Both quotes are about, are talking about revolution. Eighth graders are talking about revolution. They haven't even learned about the French Revolution yet. And basically the French Revolution was the first communist revolution. Preceded the Bolsheviks in Russia, obviously by a hundred, well, almost a hundred years. And yet, <laughs> that's what they want our eighth graders to talk about. Um, both quotes are referencing common technology of their time, et cetera. Learn, read to understand distinctions, strong tie activism and weak tie activism, high risk activism and low risk activism, motivation and participation. How much would you have hated school if this is what you did all day? Now, some of the kids, I wouldn't say they'll love it or like even like it, but they will do it. They will perform. They will get A's in it. They will take it on. This will give them purpose at a time in their life, middle school, when they're looking so hard for identity anyway. That is something I want to emphasize right here and now. Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are such a, a focus for the social justice educators because that is the time developmentally when a child is legitimately trying to individuate from their parents. They're, they are pulling away from their parents, trying to, you know, they're more influenced by peers, other adults, because they're trying to figure out who they are. So your home is like, they're, you know, kind of safe. I know you love me and whatever, but I'm going to, I'm going to go flex my muscles as an independent person. And I'll come back and I'll go out and come back and go out. And it's a vulnerable time for the parent child relationship because if they come under the influence of somebody whose values and messaging are diametrically opposed to those in the, in the home, the likelihood that they will go towards the one that's different and away from the one that is at home is very high because of that developmental phase that they're going through. And the more you try to pull them back and get them to see sense and get them to be grounded in reality, the more they'll push you away. By the way, this is what cults do too. Want to alienate the people that might pull you back out of the cult. So this social justice thing, and, and why would I call it a cult? And I, I, the gender stuff is a cult, but why would I even call this a kind of cult? Because it's not grounded in reality. It's theory. It's actually a conspiracy theory. <laughs> If you think about it, it is presented as the, the the real truth fact to the student. The student doesn't have any ability or knowledge or freedom in that environment because of the authority and the peer pressure to push back and ask really tough questions to verify that these, you know, what they're hearing is true. Uh, they're not presented with any other information. And anytime they somebody tries to put new information like their parents or somebody else, it's shot down, they're called a name, et cetera. And they're threatened with uh, being ostracized or cast out or othered if they don't come back into the fold. And that is exactly how a cult operates. So there will be students, those who are more emotionally vulnerable, those whose home lives are not super solid or where they already have friction with their parents or you know, maybe they have some sibling rivalry and they're trying to differentiate from their sibling and be different. Who knows? They can be very easily suck, sucked into this idea that, yes, I am a fighter for justice, whatever. I have a purpose now. I have an identity and I wasn't sure what it was going to be and now I know. So you know, that is, that's a, a problem. Now. Social change happens when ideas spread from person to person, place to place, and group to group. Positioned as a good thing. Universally good thing. Social change happens. Some social changes are terrible. Would you agree? <laughs> Some social changes that happen on mass are absolutely destructive. Look at, I mean, look at Pol Pot in Cambodia. Look at Mao's Cultural Revolution. Look at the French Revolution. Some social changes result in buckets of blood and mountains of bodies. Presenting to your children that all social change spread from, by activists from person to person, place to place, and group to group quickly and effectively is not de facto good. It just is. Figuring out whether it's good, whether it's just, whether it's productive, whether it's healthy, that takes a lot more analysis and a lot more background knowledge of history, economics, ethics, all the humanities, anthropology, 
I mean, there's just a few things the kids might need to learn before they could determine with any degree of reliability that social change that happens is good, bad, and different or any other thing. Yes, I just caught this loan to center. It says too high a level of abstraction on purpose to be understood by great grade eighters because their grade and te uh, and teachers' nods of approval depends on it. They memorize verbally, bypassing any ability to judge it. Thank you. Yes, exactly right. And you've got a sit, and then it's uh, Lone Center also says by the time students will be thrust into the world and have to act and judge as adults, they will have internalized the language with most at that point unable or unwilling to think outside of it. Mm -hmm. This is social engineering. This is training. This is not teaching. This is training, much as you would train a dog. Now, obviously, a higher level dog, <laughs> but a you. This is you know. What do you what do what what's the word justice? What do we you know it it you know you picture these kids chanting. You you've seen the uh, man on the street interviews with college kids where they're just spitting out talking points. They don't even seem to know the meaning of them. And you you'll you'll see that the interviewer might be a better teacher than any teacher they've ever had. But what river? What sea? Well, I don't really know. I'm not really that knowledgeable about those things. But yet you're out here with a sign from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Yeah, but I mean, it's just, you know, it should be free. But you don't know what river and you don't know what sea and you don't know what that would mean for all the people who now live between the river and the sea. This happens. But social change. Um, so let's look at, now we're looking at vocabulary. Explore content vocabulary, deep dive, radicalized. Small change, Malcolm Gladwell. I mean, eighth grade Malcolm Gladwell. I am blown away. That is not eighth grade material. I am sorry, you guys. Just no. I can't. But if you were to say, can we not do Malcolm Gladwell? You're trying to ban Malcolm Gladwell? Why are you trying to ban Malcolm Gladwell? It's like, not everything should be everywhere. Not everything is for everybody at that time. It's not a ban to say so. We used to understand this. Like, I, I mean, I used to not have to say these things, but now I feel like I have to say the most simple things. Um, use context clues to infer the meaning of radicalized because they're not going to really understand the text. Uh, launch. Have a student read a par paragraph six of the article aloud. Ask students to cite words from the paragraph that they think are particularly important to the idea of social change. Not whether the idea of social change is good or bad or indifferent. It's just, is that important to social change? Uh-huh. And they, there's a lot of that framing. You know, where is the racism in the text? You know, where is the racism in the situation? How does this solve this problem? You know, nothing, not nothing about if, why, should it? Um, have so then you know the article says thousands were arrested and untold thousands were radicalized. The sentence links the words arrested and radicalized. Maybe radicalized is an effect of the arrests. So now we're also pushing the idea that law enforcement is what turns people into protesters and radicals. So why then am I a radical? Because I'm called a radical. I'm, I'm called a domestic terrorist. I'm called all kinds of names. But what is it that radicalized me? I wasn't arrested. What is the oppression that's causing me to feel this way? I mean, they then get false cause fallacy going as their only means of making sense of the world. But it's a vocabulary lesson, y'all. <laughs> so... The, that's what I'm trying to get across to you is like, well, how did they, it's not in our book. We have written wisdom and it's got vocabulary and grammar. And they, did you read it? Did you look at it? Do you understand how that's not learning? It's not really learning. And why would they? Parents have been told for years, like, we're the experts, you're not. If parents asked about this, they'd probably be told, oh, well, you don't understand it. This is like, we, we're trained and you're not, just go away. But your gut tells you something's wrong. Listen to that. Listen to that. There's activism with and without social media. K-12 schools teach various ways a student can participate in social justice. This is all children do all day, all, um, every day and uh, every year. By the time they reach college, they're professional protesters. 
So they're teaching the children how to use social media. If you were hoping you were going to not have your eighth grader on social media, good luck because the schools are telling them what a great tool it is for social change, right? And then we have students are taught to use social media or a sit-in style protest as a possible way to be an effective activist. These are 14-year-olds. So is it any wonder that we have students at Brown University right now on a hunger strike trying to bully the university into a policy, an anti-Zionist official policy? of divestment and being, you know, anti-Israel and uh, too bad Israeli students, too bad Jewish students. Yep. Here we have, you know, ask, how might this sit in relate to your discussion of social media as a strategy for social change? Literature. Literature. So that's wit and wisdom. There you have it. That's that really sad. Now I do want to find, I'm going to stop sharing because I, um, I want to find something I'm sure you guys have seen. Well, I'm not sure if you're not on Twitter, like I am, which is too much. Um, you may not have seen it, but there was a, uh, a teacher, somebody caught a video of a teacher actually teaching. I don't know when this happened, but it was posted this week. And I was just blown away. And I do want to play this for you guys because it shows what teaching actually looks like. And it's exactly what's not happening in our schools. I found it. And if it were happening in our schools, we wouldn't be having these problems at all. So let me present this to you. Um, if you. If you haven't seen it, I mean, I've watched it like three times. Let me see if I can make this bigger. All right. I'm going to play this, and I hope you don't hear an echo. You guys want to talk about J.K. Rowling? Is that, so what's going on with that? What do you want to know? Uh, she's, she's had a pretty controversial past. I just want to know, like, what are your thoughts on it? Like, do you still like her work despite her uh, bigoted opinions? So let's get specific, though. Let's define bigoted opinions. What opinions are bigoted? We're going to treat this as a thought experiment. I'm not going to say yeah. what's right or wrong or what way to think. The whole point is to learn how to think, not what to think. Yeah. yeah. So when you say big, you, you're you're starting with the conclusion that, given her bigoted opinions. Yeah. So first, her, let's uh, start with, does she have bigoted opinions? So when you when you say bigoted opinions, she has had a history of being extremely transphobic. I've heard. And you've heard. So what? Can you give me an example? Uh if you look at her Twitter, I think um, you could see a few things. Um, if you want, I could try and find yeah, see something. If you can find, see if you can find one. So one of these tweets that she came up with in 2019, she said, dress however you please, call yourself whatever you like, sleep with any consenting adult who will have you um, live your best life in peace and security, but force women out of their jobs for starting that for stating that sex is real. So you find that bigoted? What do you find about it was in there? It was deemed transphobic. Like I myself Do you find that transphobic yourself? Uh I don't really have an opinion on it, but I'm just going with what a lot of other people have said. So let's pause it. Let's not go with what other people are saying. Let's try and learn how to critically think. So let's analyze the tweet ourselves. So that statement. Do you see anything problematic disregarding other people's opinions? Um, she did try and pin some things on a, spe a specific group of per of people. Where, she, where does she do that? do that? Can you read that? But force women out of their jobs for stating that sex is real. So when I hear that, I'm interpreting that as meaning if a woman says that, you know, saying that there is a difference between men and female and then being attacked as transphobic, I think that's what she's saying by attacking someone for stating that sex is real. That is exactly what she's saying. Is that I, transphobic to you? So to me, no. Stating that sex is real is not transphobic. It's just a fact of life. It exists. So is there anything you disagree with in that tweet? Uh in that tweet i can't really see anything that i myself disagree with but 
I can see why some people would think, oh, this is offensive. We can't have that here or something. Because sure. Uh, there's an apology tweet. What is um, she, let's read that. What did she say there? I haven't read that. I respect every trans person's right to live any way that feels authentic and comfortable to them. I'd march with you if you were discriminated against on the basis of being trans. At the same time, my life has been shaped by being female. I do not believe it is hateful to say so. Um, you see anything problematic there? She's apologizing, so no, not really. Um, if I if I could read it again, it sounds like a, the same, a very similar statement as what she was just saying. She's basically saying like, I have nothing to me. This is what I interpret it as. I have nothing against someone being trans. Exactly. Your life, but you just don't get to impose on my. You can live how you want. I can live how I want. Yeah. And let's all you know. Exactly. So I guess now, so now that we're looking at it like, oh, there's not much difference between me or her. Do you, how, why do you, do you think it's fair that there's a, that she's being attacked by a large group of people and people are calling her? Like you said, at the beginning of this conversation, you said, given the fact that JK Rowling is transphobic, how do you feel about Harry Potter? Now, yeah. retroactively looking at that statement, do you think that that was the best way to phrase? No, I feel like an idiot now. <laughs> I feel like an idiot now. Now, I don't want the kid to feel like an idiot. That's not the point. Um, but I do think that what we just witnessed is what should be going on in our nation's classrooms when it comes to discussions of race or anything controversial. Because that was just, that's exactly how you teach people how to think not what to think. And what I showed you with wit and wisdom is none of that. It is spoon feeding little tidbits of information arranged in such a way and juxtaposed in such a way to, you know, so like I said, the kid is administering the assignment. Like I'm going to find this, find that, put this here, put this here, you know, go, fill this out, change your definition that I don't even know what to call it other than ad administering an assignment completing an assignment, checking a bunch of boxes, doing busy work. There's not a lot of thought there other than what am I supposed to say? What's the correct answer? How is this social change? Social change. So you're, you're immersed in a subject. You're not learning about a subject because if you were learning about it, you'd be questioning it. Is this good? Is it bad? Do I like it? Why does it happen? When did it happen? Should it happen? Is it good that it happens? Is it, you know, like, did something come of it? Did it not? When has it gone wrong? None of that. Nothing is context contextual. Um, and I had mentioned to you before, uh, the, um, there's only two more things I have to show you. I'll go back through the comments and then we'll finish up. But I had mentioned that, um, there's a, uh, an interview. It is Ayn Rand Institute with Coleman Hughes. And it was, this was a very specific piece of it. I, I I encourage you to watch the whole interview. It's excellent. But this was just a little segment. I'm not going to play the whole segment. I'm just going to play the part where Coleman begins to answer um, the question. And the question was, what did you think of Ayn Rand's essay on racism? And this was his answer. And I, I loved his answer. Uh, racism. Uh, racism, at the end of the day, it is a rejection of individualism because you are, by definition, judging an individual by the traits or the perceived traits of, of their group. Uh, no, nobody chooses who they are born into. Uh, nobody experiences being the average member of any group they belong to. You only ever experience being the person you, in fact, are. Does me no good that the average man is five foot nine. I'm going to live my whole life five foot seven. That's how that works with respect to every, every trait that we have. Um, doesn't matter what the average income of my race is. I have the exact income I have, and that's my reality. Um, uh, I have the exact intelligence I have, the character I have, and so forth. And so to prejudge me based on what you think are the average or typical traits of my race is a rejection of the individual. And Ayn Rand as a staunch individualist, took the took that strong position against racism. And the first half of the essay, she she's mostly talking about racism against blacks in particular. 
It was also interesting, the second half of the essay, she takes aim at the idea of affirmative action and quotas uh, or reverse racism for the same exact reason and makes the point that you really can't make the first half of the argument without also rejecting the uh, forms of discrimination against whites, Asians, et cetera, um, or pro, pro minority discrimination. So she's spot on in her argument. Two observations. One, it was very similar to Zora Neale Hurston's arguments. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston is the, the beloved author of uh, and Their Eyes Were Watching God. Uh, but in her memoir, she makes the point that uh, both racial shame and racial pride just make no sense because, you know, if you, if you, if, if as a Jewish person, you feel some pride because Einstein invented physics, well, you had nothing to do with that. The fact you happen to belong to the same tribe as this brilliant person should not make you feel pride. In fact, it, it smacks of a kind of substitute, a cheap substitute for the things you might actually want to have pride in, such as the achievements you've made as an individual. By the same token, to feel ashamed that certain members of your group behave badly uh, makes no sense either because you've got no control over that. Um, and so, so uh, uh, Ayn Rand makes the, ex ex the exact same point that Zora Neale Hurston uh, makes. And then secondly, I found it interesting she was making the arguments against quotas and against affirmative action as early as 1963, because most of the writing on that subject, you know, it, it's hard to find that many public intellectuals and writers opposing affirmative action that early. Uh, because it hadn't even really been implemented yet uh, at the at the federal level until the Nixon the Nixon administration really, and so in a way she was she was sort of five to ten years ahead of her time in making the argument against affirmative action, and I thought that spoke very highly of her. So, you know, there you have it. I mean, I I think <laughs> you know it, it, that is that was essentially. The argument I ham-fistedly tried to make, because I'm no Coleman Hughes, sorry, um, when I criticized, um, are they really? So did you guys see any of that? How many ads are they putting in? I mean, I monetize it and everything, but like they're not supposed to throw ads up all over the place. I'm so sorry, you guys. Um, okay. Well, I'm sorry for the ads. Um, what was I saying? So the argument that I tried to make um, about Target and that the Black Joy thing was fueled by my, just like my understanding of what he just said. So I'm not as eloquent as he is. I was just flitting around the stupid store and on Twitter and even in subsequent responses, I was getting, you know, beaten up. So I didn't, I, you know, I'm not going to write a freaking essay there on Twitter. I, I did try. I wrote a bunch of things. But what he just said is exactly what was in my head when I looked at it. It's just like, are we doing this? Are we really going to do this? Are we going to do this racial pride thing to our kids? Are we going to raise them that way? Are we going to raise an entire generation or have we already done an entire generation of people who absolutely do not see individuals? They don't even look in the mirror and see one themselves. They only see themselves as a little piece of a bigger puzzle that without being attached to the puzzle, they're just like lost. And I, it just made me really sad, um, really sad. And what I would prefer, because people have asked me, well, what would you prefer we do with Black History Month? Or what do we do? Should we get rid of it? I don't know. I've had goes first, they get rid of it. I don't know that that's necessary. I would like to see, like I said, I would like to see us teach history in a more thorough way. And I think the people behind this organization have put something together, 1776 United have put something together that is brilliant, that is wonderful, that has so many fabulous lessons. And I would rather see teachers all year coming over here to this website to get lesson plans and 
teaching them in their classrooms instead of Black Lives Matter. I really do. Uh, look, there's for educators looking for resources, for academics or scholars, corporate individual donations, et cetera. They look at all the people featured here, including Coleman Hughes. The, I mean, these are the scholars behind this. It is not partisan. It is not partisan. These are brilliant, brilliant people. And the lessons in here, they have the, there's essays um, in here that teachers could read. Uh, this is the book that Robert Woodson wrote. Um, but I have downloaded the curriculum. I actually offer these as custom courses to students if you know homeschool families out there want their kids to learn. But the curriculum is fantastic. There are so, so many good lessons in here. And I just, with something out here like this, it's free. And it is laid out beautifully. I mean, it tells it tells the teacher it's not as scripted as the rest of like say this and then do this. But it does say, you know, here's the video. You can play the video. Here's suggested essay prompts. Here's, you know, and it is just so well done. And I don't know why they aren't using things like this for Black History Month. Find the artists that are featured, for example, rather than the stuff that they are using which I think is garbage. It is absolute garbage. It is Marxist, Maoist, globalist garbage that will just poison the minds of these children, confuse them, make them feel insecure, full of suspicion or outright hatred, and believe a conspiracy theory. And that conspiracy theory is that Everybody who doesn't look like them or isn't part of their group is against them. It's a lie. 100% it's a lie. So looking back over some of the um, the, the uh, comments that I didn't get to. Um, okay. <laughs> Lone Dissenter says they may as well start clicker training the kids. At least it, that would be out in the open. I agree. Although if you've seen some of the um, the SEL lessons, you know, blue square, but it's a green triangle, you know? And then they got like a circle of like red square and it's a blue circle or whatever. I mean, they're breaking their brains. Um, Adrian says the university president told them to go to hell. What was that in reference to Adrian? DEI won't let folks see each other's members. I'm not sure what you meant. Maybe you could clear that up for us. Um, so yeah, the, the guy, the, the, uh, the teacher that was truly Socratic. I hope he still has a job. <laughs> no, I imagine that he does. Um, let's see. Oh yeah. Here's the suggestion. Emmerich says that using privacy protector ad blocker, free download takes seconds, no ads during the stream. Thank you for sharing that information. I don't want people to have a miserable experience. I mean, I do monetize it. So they're going to put some ads in, but I, d I obviously don't want them to appear in wackadoodle places or too often. Uh, Lone Dissenter says Coleman came onto an Ayn Rand podcast, actually read Ayn Rand in advance, demonstrated an understanding and connected to the views of other thinkers. It's sad that this strikes me as remarkable. Isn't it? Now, I've watched a fair amount of Coleman Hughes, so it, I didn't think it was remarkable as far as he goes because I'm familiar with him. But if you're talking about just generally speaking, I agree with you. You know, it... it, it it's just something we've learned at this point not to expect, you know, that people are just going to pontificate on things they know nothing about. And I suppose one, you know, could say I've done that on occasion and run it like today. I mean, I'm like black joy. There'll be, there will be people that you don't even know what you're talking about, whatever. Admittedly, I've only consumed what I showed you as far as trying to learn about it. But from what I read, it looks to me like, an idea, a concept that is still grounded in critical theory. It is still based on that us versus them notion that I reject. Now, I don't think I need to know everything there is to know about black joy theory or, you know, this home space theory or whatever that is, a uh, home place theory. I don't think I need to know everything there's to know about that to have a reaction to it that is deeply skeptical, uh, concerned and saying, you're going to have to show me and persuade me that this is good 
for the people on the receiving end of this theory, especially if they are children. You've got an uphill climb there. So if you'd say, I have an uphill climb to teach people that, you know, we should be more colorblind or we should be more inclusive of, you know, just like uh, viewpoint diversity or whatever. If I, if I got to persuade people that white people aren't really against black people, well, you got to really persuade me that, that we are, that white people so-called are just universally against anybody with brown skin. I don't don't buy that for a second. I don't see it. That doesn't, and they'll say, well, you can't speak to, you know, black experience, like, but I can speak to my experience. I would never even dare to speak of to, to an experience of millions of people, nor should anyone else, including the person arguing with me. They should speak about their own experience. If they personally have had experiences, then they should know that they're running smack, you know, headlong into confirmation bias. That's your experience. You don't get to project that onto the rest of society. But instead, we're teaching children that they do get to project any personal slight onto the whole of society that looks a certain way. And what's more, they get to project slights against people who are dead onto people who were never born yet, weren't born yet. What kind of lesson is that to teach children? That is, that's like teaching them to be mentally ill teaching them to be emotionally disturbed and grossly immature. That is something a child might do because a child doesn't know better. But if you teach a child not only to do it, but reinforce it, like this is what how to look at the world, they will have an arrested development. For the rest of life, they will never mature to a level where they can even do what Coleman just did. Ever. The likelihood it will ever happen is limited to none. Um... Okay. Uh, Adrian says, I forgot who, but there was quite a smear job from a news outlet calling Coleman a conservative and he is not. No, he most certainly is not a conservative. People were calling me a right-wing nut job. Uh, I've been called MAGA, right-winger. You know, I'm not a conservative. I'm not a lefty, but I'm not a conservative either. If conservative equals, I mean, like, who would we, who would we look at at this point? Uh, Throw me some names. <laughs> Candace Owen or somebody. No. <laughs> um, oh, the sit-in that, that oh, did they throw did, did did they throw the kids out? Wait a minute. Is that what you were talking about? Oh, the university president. Was it Brown University told them to go to hell? Oh, that'd be great news. Their university president told them no. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I my attitude was, and they started doing that, and I got all kinds of heat. Like, oh, you're do you have any takes that aren't awful? I said, let them let them go home and starve. They, if you're going to be disruptive, not go to class, have a sit-in, do a hunger strike, and now you're on the the school's liability. If you get sick or you die or something happens, they might get sued. I'd be like, all right, you know what? You're suspended. Go home and have your hunger strike when you decide you're going to eat, and not be engaged in this kind of nonsense, you can come back. But I'm not, we're not going to be responsible for you not eating. That's not, not on our watch. That's what I would have done. Plus they're adults. So they, you know, they don't have some, like their parents paid tuition or they're paying tuition, but that doesn't give, give them this inalienable right to stay on campus and do whatever the hell they want. So, uh, I think that's about all I have for you this evening. I realize it was a lot. Thank you for hanging in with me. Um, but the bottom line for me is that Black History Month ought to be about history. It ought to belong to all of us because it is the history of our nation. And the people who made that history contributed to all of our lives. And we should all recognize their achievements, their accomplishments, their contributions, and celebrate them. Not use this as an opportunity to segregate ourselves from each other. That is my final word. So thank you again. Please like, share, subscribe, all the things, and consider joining my woke screen community where we have private chats and other things. And the more, the more people we get over there, the more fun, cool stuff we can do. Join the collab group with the woke screen, with Kieran's woke screen, not just the reason we learn. And there's already more people there. And we actually really have a fun time over there. So you should join join uh, the collaborative community and you can have both, the best of both worlds. Um, but if you do join, you are supporting my work. So I greatly appreciate that. Thank you for coming this evening. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Take it easy. Bye-bye.